Hey everyone, how's it going? I have another full stack tutorial which I want to share with you all today. Hope you guys are interested. Basically, in this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to build out DevFinder, which is a service that allows other developers to find people to pair a program with. Maybe you're stuck on something you want to share your screen, and other developers can kind of filter based on tags and join and kind of watch you as you're trying to code, maybe work with you along the way. Um, let's just demo what we're going to build, and I'm going to walk you through some of the technology that we're going to be using in this. So first thing, we got some dark mode, we got some light mode, pretty cool. Let's go ahead and sign in. We have authentication that's set up with next auth. So let me just go ahead and sign in with my Google provider. And once you're assigned in, you can go and create a new room so that other people can join you. So let's go ahead and create a room. I'm going to go ahead and say dev finder. The description is going to say a side project to help developers find other people to pair program with. For the Git repo, let's just go ahead and grab my dev finders project repo and then down here for tags, we'll say TypeScript, Next.js, we'll say Drizzle, ORM, we'll say Next Auth, and Shad CN. Those are some of the tools that we'll be using in this tutorial. So I'll submit that, that room will be created. And now if I go and switch this from OBS to my face, we have live video chat with screen sharing, right? Down at the bottom, we can see all the participants who are in this chat, and also we can share a screen, we can chat with our microphone. Let me just go ahead and join with another tab over here. So I am logged in on another incognito tab with a different user. I'm gonna browse, and I can see that that dev room is now popping up. So we see dev finder over here. So one feature is we have the ability to search for rooms based on tags. So for example, I could type in TypeScript and press enter, and that'll only show me the rooms that other people are in where they're kind of working with TypeScript or ShadCN or whatever. We can also get a link to their GitHub repo. So clicking this will take us to the repo. I can learn more about the project that they're working on, maybe look through their issues, see if I can maybe contribute with them. I can go and see my own rooms, which this user doesn't have any. So let's go back to browse. I'm gonna join this room and we'll have two users. I'll go ahead and allow my camera. Awesome, so now we have two people in this chat room. And the cool thing is, is that one user could potentially share their screen and I can see that. So let's just go ahead into my other tab. I'll just have that user share the Drizzle ORM tab. And as you can tell, I can see the screen that they're sharing right over here, right? So they could basically live code with me. They could share their code. I could talk with them. And I could potentially full screen this if I wanted to and actually get a better look at what they're doing. Escape to get out of that. And you can also edit a room. So clicking here will take you to an edit page. I can go ahead and just give a, I can go here and just edit this. And I'll click submit. And that'll take us back. You can see that update happens. And we also get a nice toast that told the user that the edit happened. And then we can also filter by tag. So for example, this room has tags in Next.js. If I go ahead and click on one of these tags, it'll automatically take us back to our browse page with our filter set up inside the input box. And now we'll see all the rooms that are also working on node content. And that's basically what we're going to be building in this application. Finally, we have the ability for a user to sign out or delete their entire account, which will clean up all of their rooms and delete that data, which I'll just go ahead and do that. I'm going to delete my account and we should see it just go ahead and wipe out all the data that was associated with that user. And then finally, this is deployed somewhere. So I'll kind of walk you through how this is all deployed out. So let me talk real quick about the tech that we're going to be using. First of all, I want to give a special thanks to our sponsor, which is Stream. Go to GetStream.io, and we are going to be using their video and audio product. This has a bunch of built-in React components, iOS, Android, JavaScript, etc. And honestly, with very little effort, you can get that screen sharing capabilities with just basically importing a couple of components. And you'll see that as we kind of build out this tutorial. So definitely a really cool service. I was actually super impressed with how easy it was to get the streaming set up. Second thing, we are going to be using Next.js with server actions and React server components a little bit. We're going to be using ShadCN for our components. I love ShadCN. I think it's very easy to build a UI with ShadCN. For the ORM, we're using Drizzle ORM and connecting to a Postgres database, which is running locally in a Docker container. And then also when we go to production, we are going to be using Railway. I will say Railway is not a sponsor of this video. I just think their service is pretty good, but they are a paid service. So if you want to go to production, you may have to take out a credit card, but it's very easy to spin up a Postgres database and also deploy your Next.js application. And then finally, we're going to be using Next Auth for the authentication of this application. If you're interested in any of the code, it is found here in this URL. I'll put this in the description link below. Other than that, that's about everything we're going to be building in this application. I hope you guys enjoy watching. If you want to learn more about Next.js or any of the technologies that I just mentioned, let's just go ahead and jump into it and have some fun.
All right, so let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I usually do is I'm gonna make a repository and let's name it Dev Finder. So Dev Finder is the name of our application. And we'll just say MIT. Just go ahead and create this repository. And then we are gonna clone it down. So I'm gonna click on this code button. Now I'll click on this copy to clipboard URL. Now I have um, SSH key set up. If you don't, you might have to do HTTPS, but I'll just go ahead and copy this to my clipboard. And then in my workspace, I'm gonna say git clone and go ahead and clone that repo down. And then I'm gonna open it up so we can start coding on it. So we are using Next.js. So the first thing I'm gonna do is MPX create next app at latest. Just go ahead and do that in this directory. That'll go ahead and ask us a couple questions. I'll just use the defaults for everything. All right, and now that that is done, let's just make sure it works. So npm run dev, that should spin up your Next.js application on localhost 3000. You see this page, you know everything is working correctly. So some additional setup we're gonna do is, I like using shadcn for all my components. I think it's a really great component library. So let's go and go to the installation guide. Let's go to Next.js. And let's just go ahead and start at number two because we already ran number one. So let's just go ahead and copy this. We're going to run that in another terminal over here. We'll zoom in one more. Okay, we're going to use the default. So let's say, yes, we want CSS variables. We want the slate base color, and we should be good. So to verify this is working, what I'd recommend doing right off the bat is just go ahead and set up dark mode. They have a nice getting started guide about dark mode. So we're going to install Next Themes, which is a library that you can use to kind of set up dark mode. And most applications, you should probably have dark and light mode. It just, it's better user experience. So it's, you might as well just do this right off the gate, right? So let's go ahead and make a components theme provider. Over here, I'll say source components theme provider.tsx, paste that code in and save it. And then let's go to app layout. So let's just go ahead and copy this. Let's find app slash layout. Command P can do your fuzzy searching. And then we're going to go ahead and just import that theme provider like they ask you to. And then we're going to wrap our code right here with the children. Let's just go ahead and wrap that in the theme provider like this. Now make sure I put it inside the body. Now something else you sometimes have to do is you have to add the suppress hydration warning on the HTML. So adding that and then we could try adding a mode toggle button. So the way you do that is you go to the code tab. We're going to copy this. And then we're going to go to components over here and we'll just say mode hyphen toggle CSX. Paste that in. Make sure this is good. So this does depend on a Shad CN button in a Shad CN drop down menu. So one thing we haven't done yet is how do you install these other components, right? Shad CN is a little bit different. Everything is not just given to you out of the box. You have to install these things individually. So if we go to the button component over here, we can actually just run this command. Go ahead and copy that. And then I'm going to run it in my terminal. And that will grab the button code and put it in your components library. As you can see over here, we have a button inside this UI folder. And we should be good to go. And notice that now we don't have a TypeScript error here because it found that component we were looking for. So we also need a drop down. So let's go over here, drop down menu, copy it, uh, paste it in. And that's basically the gist of Shad CN. You want something, you just go ahead and install it and you just start using it. So now if we were to go back to layout, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to go ahead and put like a header here. So let's just go ahead and say a div. Um, for now, we'll come back and we'll abstract this into like a reusable header component. But I'm gonna go ahead and say just uh, mode toggle or what do we call it? Yeah, it's called mode toggle. Let's say mode toggle, import that, save it. And now let's hope that everything works fine. Go ahead and refresh the page, see if it shows up. So click it um, and notice that we have light mode. We got dark mode. Awesome. Now I like to keep it as system and my system is dark mode. So we will probably keep this um, during the whole tutorial, but just keep in mind as you're adding new components and doing new pages, it's always good to double check that when you switch to light mode, because there's still a lot of people who use light mode, that it looks good. All right. So we've made some progress. Um, what I like to do throughout my tutorials is I like to commit small chunk size commits throughout the entire process. So let's just go ahead and say um, initial next setup in shad cn with dark mode. Now the reason I do this is that you can actually follow along and if you're good at git you can kind of go back through the commits and view them as they're changing over time. 
Okay, so now if I go to my commits, we have our first commit here. If you ever want to go back and kind of check that out, you can just go ahead and click on it and see like what did I add at that part of this tutorial. So the next thing I want to get set up is some type of connection to a database. Typically you need to use an ORM or if you just want to connect to your database directly with SQL statements, you can do that. I like using something called Drizzle ORM. There's also Prisma. There's also other ORMs you can use, but I think Drizzle is a nice uh, middle ground between like not giving too much abstraction, but also giving just enough abstraction that you can become very proficient at it. All right, so going to the get started, we're going to be using Postgres. And I'm going to use Postgres.js as our driver. You can connect this to basically multiple different types of databases, and they have different drivers you can use if you're using MySQL or Postgres or SQLite. Basically, just read those documentations, but I'm going to use Postgres. And the way you kind of get this started is you run npm install drizzle ORM and this Postgres package. Let's go ahead and run that. There we go. And then also I'm going to install drizzle kit as a dev dependency. And we'll talk about what drizzle kit is in a bit, but let's just go ahead and get that set up. So following their documentation, what you can do is you can just go ahead and inside a source directory. I could add one called DB and we'll make one called index.ts. Let's go over here and let's just copy this starting code. And let's look, kind of look through it a little bit, make sure we understand what's going on. So this is going to import the Drizzle ORM. That's like a library we use to connect to the database and easily query and store data. Um, there's also this migrate function, which we won't worry about just yet. And then we're going to bring in Postgres, which we already, should already have installed. And the migration client we don't need right now. But what we do want is the query client and also this DB object. So I'm going to make sure I export DB over here. And all this other stuff, um, we're just going to get rid of for right now. And one thing you'll notice is that there's like this URL over here. This is the connection URL that you're going to need so that the Drizzle ORM knows where your database lives. And so if you were to be renting a Postgres database from like Railway or Supabase, that's the URL you're going to, you're going to point in. In this tutorial, I am going to be using Docker to set up a local Postgres database. And the reason I do this is because often these services that give free and hobby plan tiers, you never know if they're going to not use those hobby plans anymore. So I want my tutorials to be resilient to these third party services getting rid of their free plans. So we are going to be using Docker. It's not too hard to understand and learn. So keep that in mind. So once we have this index.ts stuff set up, what I want to do is I want to create a docker compose file. So I'm going to say docker compose.yaml. And you're going to have to go and read up on how to install docker on your machine and docker compose. I'm not going to walk you through that. Or if you just want to install Postgres directly onto your machine, that's an approach too. This is where I kind of recommend that you go and figure this out yourself or just find a service that provides you a hobby tier Postgres database. But I already have a docker compose yaml file. And I'm going to paste this in here and we're going to go ahead and rename some stuff. So I'm going to rename this to dev finder. And what this Docker compose file does is it kind of defines what containers it needs to spin up when you run Docker compose up. So in our case, it's saying, I need you to spin up a Postgres database on this port. In fact, let me make this uniform. This is the password you're going to be using when you spin it up. Here is a volume mount. So basically this is telling Docker to grab some place in your disk and bind it to the container so that it can actually persist data as you're working on this. And you can dive more into this if you want to, but really you could just like install this file. Now, the second thing you need to do is install Docker desktop if you're on Mac and there's other solutions out there, but basically you need some type of Docker daemon that can spin up these containers and images for you. So. I'm going to go ahead and just spin up Docker desktop. When it is ready, I can do a Docker compose up and you'll see that it's going to pull in the Docker file. It's going to spin it up and it's going to run my Postgres service. So right now it's saying the database system is ready to accept connections. And I might just go over here and rename this. I'll just go ahead and say this is like my, my DB and uh, I'll rename this one to like next. All right, so now we should hopefully never need to look at this Docker Compose file other than what we're gonna need to do is go over here and change the password, which I believe is this line. I'm gonna say example. And then this is just gonna be localhost instead of the 0000. I think they'll both work the same way. Um, 
And then for slash db, I think we want to give it an actual name. I think we want to call it Postgres like that. And hopefully this will work. Now, what I would recommend doing is don't hard code this URL. I would actually make a .env file and I would paste in the full URL there. Okay, so same thing. It's just the username of your connection URL, the password, the location or the host, you could call it, the port, and then your database name. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this environment variable. And instead of hard coding it, I'm going to say process.env dot database URL. And then I'll just put it a exclamation mark so that TypeScript is happy about that. And we should hopefully be good. So again, what we're doing is we're setting up Drizzle ORM and we're also pulling in Postgres so that we can connect to a database and persist our data. Um, but there is another step where we need to define like a schema. Let's go here and say schema.ts. And then we are going to just go ahead and start trying to define a table that we're going to need to use in our Postgres database. All right, so just to kind of get us started, I grab some code, and this is how you define your schema. You basically need to create a bunch of different variables. In our case, I'm making a table called testing. That table consists of a column called ID, which is a type of text ID, not null, primary key, and then also a name column. And we're just kind of creating this right now so we can verify, like, do we set this up all correctly? And then this, make sure whenever you import these things, make sure you import them from Drizzle or M PG core, because again, we're using Postgres. So make sure you import it from the right package. So now that we have a basic schema file set up, we're going to go ahead and try to pass it in here. So we need to say import star from schema. And then we're going to go ahead and try to pass in, uh, we could probably add schema and we'll pass it in here like this and probably wrap it. That should make it happy. And now we have this DB object. And so if we wanted to potentially read or write from the database, we could do that. But let me show you something else that's really important when it comes to Drizzle. There's something called Drizzle Kit, which we already installed. And this is a tool that's very useful for basically creating your migration scripts or just applying changes to your Postgres database. The way SQL databases work is you have to write code, SQL statements, to create tables, update their columns, rename columns, define the types on those columns, etc. It looks kind of like this. And the cool thing about Drizzle Kit is it does all this for you. You don't have to worry about like writing these migration scripts usually. So to get started with Drizzle Kit, I'm going to go ahead and copy this code. And then I'm going to make a file called drizzleconfig.ts here. So like drizzle, drizzleconfig.ts. I'll paste that code in. And we need to make sure that we point to source DB schema. We want to use the PG driver for Postgres. And then for connection string, we just need to use that database URL that we defined. And this is basically telling DrizzleKit how to connect to your database when you want to run certain commands, okay? So if this is set up correctly, what we can do, go to our package.json, and we're going to add a new one called db colon push, and we're going to paste in this command. This is basically telling Drizzle that, hey, whenever someone makes changes to our schema files, I need you to use this config file figure out how to connect to my database and apply those changes to that database. So if, hopefully if I did this right, I can say npm run db push, and that should apply the changes to my locally running uh, Postgres table. So you can see when I'm running this command, it's saying, hey, do you want to run this command, create table if it doesn't exist? I'm going to say yes. Go ahead and execute that, and it did work fine. And so that leads us to the third thing that you're going to need if you're using Drizzle. That's Drizzle Studio. It's a nice UI that gives you a nice experience for modifying, inserting records, deleting records. Kind of like MySQL Workbench if you use that, but not as feature rich. So let's scroll down and let's see how to do this. Basically you run MPX Drizzle Kit Studio. I like making aliases in my package JSON. So let's just go ahead and say like DB Studio. And we're gonna run that command here. And so in a third terminal, you could call this Studio. I can say npm run DB Studio. Um, it is complaining that I don't have a PG package. So let's just go ahead and install npm install PG. I guess I missed doing that at some point. And then we can go ahead and just run the studio. And you'll get a link down here. If you go ahead and command click that link, it'll open up your Chrome tab to Drizzle Studio. And again, this is the UI that you can use to basically connect to your tables 
and look at the data. If you notice here, we have a table called testing. So our previous command, our db push command, look through our schema, it figured out how to create this table, and then it created for us. So if we want to go ahead and add a record here, I can just go ahead and say like um, ID, we'll keep that empty right now. I'll say name is hello world. If I save this, does this auto add something? I'll just go ahead and say like eight, whatever. So now we have one record in our table. And this is kind of setting us up because we want to connect our Next.js application to this database to be able to fetch this data and read from this table, right? So at this point, um, I'm going to commit. I do see that this .env file is here. So let's find the git ignore right here. Go down to the bottom, I'll say .env. We do not want to commit our .env files ever. Let's just do that. And then we're going to go ahead and add all this. So I'm just going to go ahead and click this plus sign. I'll say setting up drizzle ORM. Okay, go ahead and commit that, sync that up, and we should be good. Another thing that most projects do is they'll have an env.sample. And this is so if someone were to clone the project, they will know how to like get this go going locally, right? So I'm going to say replace this with the real URL of your Postgres database. And I'll probably just go ahead and add that too. I'm adding that env.sample. I would say usually the setup, the initial setup of these tutorial projects is like the most boring part. But if you haven't done it before, it's good to have someone kind of walk you through the process because it can be kind of overwhelming. It's a lot of stuff you have to connect together. And um, hopefully you're learning something by watching me do this. So now I want to verify, can our Next.js application, can it load that record when it loads, right? So Next.js is a server-side rendering library like primarily, right? And then you can opt in the client side rendering and doing all this other stuff. So if we were to kind of like delete all of this code, I want to just keep this simple and kind of verify that we can actually read data from the database. I'll talk about how the app router like works later on um, when we get to it, but let's just focus on how do we get some data back from that database? So I'm going to say const and I want to say like items is equal to db. We're going to go ahead and import that from that DB. Um, remember that DB thing we created over here? There's this index file, and that's kind of hooking everything up with Drizzle to our database. But we want to go ahead and use that DB object, and we're going to wait on it. So make sure you put async here so that we can do like an actual asynchronous server call. And then we'll say DB dot. I think we can do query. And then we can say dot testing. And then we want to say find mini and just go ahead and run that. And so the way Next.js works is when you navigate to this route, it's going to run this code, which is going to fetch data from our database. And then we get our items back. Notice how this is type safe already. It's a list of items. But we can just go ahead and map over that. Let's just go ahead and say curly brace items map. For every item, we want to just go ahead and return something. Make sure we put a key here of the ID. And then over here, we can just say item.name. All right. So moment of truth, if we go back, we should see hello world pop up. And it does because we're loading from the actual database. So congratulations, you have everything set up, you're connected to the database, you're fetching some data down. And if you're able to see this, that means that you have everything set up correctly. If I were to change this to something else, like what is up, go ahead and save that, go back to my UI and refresh it. Again, just to kind of emphasize that we are connected to a Postgres database that's running in that Docker Compose setup, and we're storing and retrieving data. So now that we have the database set up, let's move on to one of the core pieces of functionality our application will need, and that is authentication. How can you set authentication up with Next.js? One of the easiest ways is by using something called Next Auth. So let's go to nextauthjs.org. And let's go ahead and check out the getting started guide. I'm going to go ahead and just run this command, copy that. And then I'll open up a new terminal and I'll install that package. So when it comes to next auth, they do have documentation, but for some reason they still haven't like updated it to just use the new app router. Like they still have pages stuff in here. So read the fine print. It's saying if you want to use route handlers, follow this guide. Basically you follow this guide and it tells you to make an app API auth directory. Um, next auth folder. So let's just go ahead and make a new folder like that. And I think I can just put it right here. Uh, I think I made it a little bit a uh, wrong app thing. Let's just delete that. And then over here, 
you make one called route.ts. So I'll just go ahead and make a new file, say route.ts, and we're going to copy in some of this code here, like this. And this is basically an endpoint that various third party providers are going to use to send you tokens and make sure that you're logged in and registered and stuff like that. But this next auth takes in a configuration. And so if you want to use this, you basically need to pass it some custom things. So the first thing we want to pass is an adapter. This is basically telling next auth how it can connect to our database using Drizzle. And then I believe we're going to have to install a Drizzle adapter. So let's just go ahead and install at auth slash Drizzle adapter. And then we should be able to auto import this in. And then we also want to auto import our database object like this. And that should hopefully work well. But if you do want more information about this, go to authjs.dev and you'll see that there's an official Drizzle ORM adapter for this. This is how you can kind of get it set up. Um, add the adapter to your pages API next auth.ts file. And this is kind of the code that we were about to do. So let's just go ahead and copy the providers as well, like this. I do plan to use a Google provider in this example. So we need to import the Google provider from next auth, like that. And to use this, it actually requires a Google client ID and a client secret. I'm just gonna pretend like they're set for right now, but we'll have to go and like, I'll walk you through how to get that all set up with auth. Now, additionally, what we're gonna need to do is in our schema file, we have to define some new tables because next auth is gonna try to write to a user's table. It tries to write to an accounts table. And you can see in this example setup, we can just go ahead and pull in all this code, sessions, verification tokens, et cetera. And make sure you grab the Postgres one. So over here, I'm on Drizzle Adapter. They tell you how to set it with Postgres. Let's go to Schema, and let's just paste in all that stuff, okay? And let's make sure I move the imports to the top of the file, like this. I'm sure I have duplicates, so let's delete that. Now, we are getting a little TypeScript error about this adapter, and what people online are saying is you want to import the type adapter and just basically cast this as an adapter object. Two weeks ago, people were saying that this is just like broken, but that's coding for you, right? You literally stuff is breaking all the time and you have to sit there and try to figure out how to fix it. So now if this is set up correctly, which I hope it is, you have to set up a Google auth provider. So I'm gonna walk you through how you do that. So if you go into Google Cloud and go to API and services, you can make a new project here. So I'm gonna make one called, uh, we'll call it Dev Finder. Go ahead and click Create. And this might take couple seconds to create. Um, but once it's done, you can go ahead and click over here and you can dive into this project and select it. Okay, everything seems good. And we want to, first of all, click on configure consent screen. I do believe you have to do that first before you can create an API key. So I'm going to say this is going to be an external app. The app name will be dev finder. Support email, I'll just use my email account. Um, all this other stuff, I believe you might be able to just leave blank. I don't think you need local host here, but let's just say web dev Cody at gmail.com. Save and continue. Just keep on saying save and continue. And then finally at the bottom, I'll say back to the dashboard. Um, you do want to click before you go to production, like you want to click publish app. We're not going to probably do that in this tutorial, but what we need is credentials. After you set up what we just did, you need to go to credentials and you need to create a new credential here. And I'll say, we want an OAuth client ID. Okay, let's just go ahead and say, this is a web application called Dev Finder. And we want to add an authorized JavaScript origin. So that'd be HTTP localhost 3000. And then for the redirect URLs, we want to add that API that we've been kind of working on. So remember it's API slash auth. And then you want to do um, I think it's callbacks slash Google. I don't remember off the top of my head. I always have to go look this up. It's either callback or callback Google. Um, let's just save it. And uh, at this point, you'll get back a client ID. You can copy that. And that is what this Google client ID is. So let's just go to here. I'll say Google client ID is equal to this. And then also, we have a Google client secret that we need to set up, which is here. I'll copy that one, paste it in. And then again, let's make sure we update our sample so that if anyone were to clone this project, they can get the setup themselves. Now that we've set all that stuff up, 
we have to do some more work, right? I think we need to provide a setup of a provider that wraps our Next.js application so that we know if we're authenticated or not. So let's go back to the next auth guide and notice here they have something called a session provider. So I think I can just import this like that and we want to wrap our code uh, with our session provider, I believe. Yeah, so let's just go ahead and say session provider and we're going to wrap Beam toggle with this. So we are running into an issue with the session provider. It has to run in a client component. So in order to get this working, you have to say, make a new file called providers. And then we are going to go ahead and grab kind of all this code. And I'll say export function providers. And we're going to go ahead and just return that code there. We want to make sure we bring in children over here like that. Make sure we auto import some stuff. Make sure we bring in the theme provider. And then we want to go ahead and just render out the children. Put that there. Auto import that. And now the reason you're doing this is because you want to put use client at the top of this so that Next.js knows how to properly do the hydration and the server side rendering and client side rendering. So let's just go ahead and say providers. And then I'm going to wrap all this code that we had here. I'm going to put that there and go ahead and delete that. Save it. Okay, and now we can kind of delete this stuff and hopefully this will work now. Okay, so it's loading. Everything should be okay. So I think this would be a good opportunity to kind of abstract the header away. Let's just go ahead and make a new file called header.tsx. We're going to say export function header. Go ahead and just return. I'm a header component and put that code in there. So we do want the mode toggle and we're going to say use client here because we want to bring in some dynamic functionality. Okay. So in Next.js and inside of Auth.js, you can check if someone's logged in by saying const session equals use session like that. All right. So now that we have this session variable, we can check if someone is logged in or not. So I can say if session dot data, uh, we could probably do like a ternary here. And then I'm going to go ahead and just say, make a button like this, go ahead and import it. And if we are logged in, we're going to go ahead and just say, sign out. And if we're not logged in, we will have another button that says sign in. Let's just say sign in like this, save it. And so on the button itself, we have this ability to call a sign in function that's provided from next auth. And you can actually pass like Google to this if you want to, if you just want it to automatically go to the Google sign in. So we could try doing that. Um, but probably we should put the sign in on the real sign in button. So let's paste it down here and over here. I'll say sign out like that. Okay. So now that we have the header, go back to the layout. And the reason we're doing this is so we have a nice header component. You kind of abstracted away that logic. And now we should see a header that says sign in. So all right, so before we can actually click the sign in button though, remember we did all this like Prisma stuff where we added new tables. I don't think we ever applied those. So let's go to another terminal down here. I'm going to say npm run db push. And that's going to loop over all of the tables that we just created, such as the accounts table, the sessions table, the users table, verification, and have all this SQL kind of generated for us. I'm going to say yes, I want to apply those. And now it says changes applied. And hopefully now our next app might just restart it just for good measures. Let's just go ahead and click sign in. And then I'm going to click my user account. And now notice it says sign out at the top. So now we are actually authenticated. The UI knows that we're logged in and it actually knows who we're logged in as. If I were to go and print out um, in the header or in the body or something, uh, I'll just go ahead and print out like session.data dot user dot name and you should see my name pop up okay so we know we are logged in as uh, my account awesome so again all of this all of this was just set up we're still just setting up our next.js application to be auth ready to also have a nice ui kit using shad cn to have a database with postgres and drizzle orm and we're kind of, I think, done, hopefully, cross my fingers, done setting up and gluing all this stuff together.
And we actually have authentication with Google working, which is a big win. So I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna go ahead and commit this. And I will say, finish setting up next off. Go ahead and sync that up and uh, we should be good. So if you're watching this tutorial for the first time, you're like, wow, we just spent like 30 minutes just setting up an application. This is why I recommend finding a template. Just start with a template. Everything is already hooked together. You have auth, you have your database, you have some initial landing page, a header, a footer, already set up for you with Next.js. I think that's like the easiest way to get started. But going through all these steps, I think helps people understand how to set up an application for yourself. So let's actually start trying to implement some of this functionality. So the first thing that I would want to do for this dev finder application is for allowing someone to basically upload a session. And what I mean by a session, um, like a dev session, is I want to have some initial information about maybe what project they're working on, what type of code they're writing. Is it Rust? Is it Go? Is it JavaScript, TypeScript? And so they can basically create their session and other people can browse the sessions and then maybe click on their session so they can view what they're doing. And then they can actually start live coding together or just like join a live chat or a video call where you can view their screen and see what they're doing. I think that's the first step. So creating this session would be kind of the first step and we'll do like iterative development here and just slowly add this in. So schema, first thing we wanna do is I'm gonna make another table. And now we already have one called sessions so it can kind of get a little bit confusing. So instead, let's just call it a room. Okay, this is like a dev room. I'll just call it a room. And what we want to do here is we do want to have this room reference a user. So as a user, if I create a new room, I want that room to belong to me so that when I decide I wanted to delete that room or close the room or something, I'm the one with the permissions. Okay, so we definitely want a user ID here. And the way this syntax works is we say, hey, we want this user ID to be a type text. And then we want this to reference the users table, which was defined up here. Remember we have a users table and this is how you can kind of do references with Drizzle is just like that. And I know there's a lot of stuff I kind of copied in and didn't really talk about, but I would say just focus on the new things we're adding and then go back and try to understand the things that we just uh, previously added for next off. And the second options for references is basically saying, hey, if the user were to delete his account, make sure you also delete this room from his account too. So definitely want a user ID there. We also probably want a name of the room. Let's just go ahead and do that. Maybe I'll say like language. That could be a text. Maybe they want to type in TypeScript or JavaScript, or we could have like a drop down that allows them to choose what's their primary language of the project. Um, maybe a GitHub link or repo. Maybe you want to be able to add in a link to a GitHub repo. Maybe you don't. I think that's a good enough start. That's a lot of stuff. So again, whenever you create a new table or something, remember npm run db push and make sure you apply those changes like that. And now our table will have access for us to store a room and associate that with the user. All right, so let's make a new route. We haven't talked about Next.js routes yet, but in this app folder, any directory you add in basically is used for the routing. So if I were to make a new one called rooms, or if I want to call it like create room, this would allow us to basically go here and say slash create room. And that's going to look for a page.tsx file. So if I were to go here and say page.tsx and say export default function, create room page, go ahead and just return maybe a, a div. Maybe we want like a title that says create room and that should be good for right now. So let's test that out. If I go to create room, it says create room up here. Okay. So the initial thing is probably getting a form where a user can type in like the information about the room, the description, the language they're using, and then have a submit button. So that'll persist some data to a database. So let's just go ahead and add a form in here and I'm going to go ahead and add in some inputs. Now I will say since we're using Shad CN, they do recommend, um, at least their approach they do is they use um, React hook form, which I think is just a better developer experience than doing like HTML form inputs and stuff like that. So I'm gonna do it the Shad CN way. So if I go over here, you should be able to find a form and we have to install 
a couple of things that kind of get this going, right? So the first thing that we need to do is we need to install the form component. So let's go ahead and add the form component down here. And then secondly, we are going to make a new file. We're going to call this the create room form.tsx because I want this to be a client component. Okay, so export function create room form. And then we're going to go ahead and just start pasting in some things. So the first thing you need to paste in is Zod. This is the way we're going to validate our form. If you need more fine tuned validation, you definitely want to bring in Zod. So I'm going to go ahead and install that and make sure it's set up. And then you define a form schema. We're going to keep it as username for now, just to make sure this all works. And then we'll come back and we'll change it. So the next step is we need to bring in the Zod resolver in the use form hook. So let's just go ahead and do that. And I think when we added the form with Shad C and it already installed those things, so we should be good. Let's just continue down. So step one is they define a form. Grab this, go ahead and put it in that component there. And this is basically saying, hey, just make a form data structure that allows us to call different methods on it. So at this point we could say like form dot I don't know, clear errors, reset. This is an important object you're going to need to use um, basically to control the form and like keep track of values and stuff. All right, so the next step, define an on submit handler. Let's just go ahead and copy that. Paste it in. And this is going to be typed uh, correctly. So whatever values you define up here in your form schema, notice how you have those values right here. You don't have to mess with like form data and pull those data out of the form object. That all works. And now they tell you to build your form. So let's just go ahead and pull in those components right here. Now we are missing input. So I do want to add the input component, which we can say add input. That should be installed and we should be able to see it soon. Let's keep scrolling a little bit. And here's the example of their form. So I can go ahead and copy this whole thing. And we're going to scroll down and we're going to return an entire form like this. Awesome. So I know it's a lot of copying and pasting, but that's literally what you end up doing in coding, right? Once you understand like what the code's doing, you start just copying and pasting these patterns all throughout your code base. So let's make sure this works. I'm going to go to our form page and I'm going to bring in the create room form that we just defined. And I'm going to save this file and we should be able to go back to our app and we see a form here. Now, the cool thing is this has validation built in already. Um, it's a little bit hard to see. I'm not sure why the, the dark red is so dark, um, but we can probably correct that later. So now this requires you to type in at least two characters and then the validation goes away. Okay. This is one reason why I wanted to just bring in the way Shad CN uses the form, because if you wanted to implement this all yourself, it's a lot of extra logic. It's a lot of keeping track of like validation errors. So again, I think this is the best user experience um, in developer experience out of the box. Um, which is why I recommend it. All right, so let's keep pushing forward. What do we need from the user when they want to create a room? All right, the first thing they want a name. You definitely want to name the room, and I'll change that to a min of one. And then they also want a description, which I might actually make that required after all. Uh, I can go back to the schema and change that, but we're going to go ahead and just default it to an empty string there. And this will be called name. Actually, we're going to grab this whole form field and we're going to do another one for description. So here we'll say description, we'll say description. Um, this is, uh, please describe your room. Please, please describe what you'll be coding on. Technically, I don't really like placeholders. I'll be honest with you. If you have a label, what's the point of a placeholder? I'm going to get rid of the placeholders. And now we should see a name and we also see a description. And then I'll say, this is your public room name. Okay. Now what other things do we need? So let's look at the schema. We have a language and then we also have a Git repo. Okay. So we could make some form fields for those. So I'll say, go up here. We're going to add one for GitHub repo, which I'll make it required. And then I'll also say language that could be required. Um, I am using Copilot just to kind of do some of this nitty gritty stuff which I don't want to do by hand anymore. And then we're going to go ahead and say this will be GitHub repo. GitHub repo. Please put a link to 
the project you are working on. Okay. And then finally, we want the language. Um, language. Programming. Language. I might even say primary so it makes more sense. The primary programming language you are working with. And that's basically so you can find people who are working with TypeScript. Like you don't want to go and join a, a Rust room if you have no idea what you know how Rust works. Or you don't want to join a PHP room if you're mainly a Go developer. Okay. So now we have all these fields. And we should be able to create the room. Is there anything else that we're missing from the schema? It looks like we have everything. And so at this point, there are some stylistic things we can do on this page. Like if you wanted to wrap this whole thing in a div, we could do that. And we do want to give this a class name. I'm going to say container MX auto, just so it's not like hugging the left side of the page. Cause that was kind of not the best, right? We want a little bit of padding and then the create room. Um, Actually, now that I think about it, we shouldn't put that here. That should live on the page. Let's go back to the page, and I'm going to just do that. And we want to keep the form here. I apologize for that. Let's just do this. All right. Um, a little bit more styling. I could go ahead and just say this is a class name. This is text for Excel. On bold if you want to. There you go. If you wanted to put some gap between these two things, you could say display a flex column gap of four. That's one way you can do it, maybe even gap of eight. Okay, and then for the title itself, you could say uh, this is going to be like a padding top of 12. I'll push it down a little bit. Okay, so now we have a nicer looking form. And then also the bottom of this, I'm going to say padding bottom of 24. That when I scroll down, you can actually see the button. Okay, looks nicer, right? Now, technically for description, we could use like a text area, but I think input's fine. So let's make sure this all passes validation. Everything should be required. Okay. I'm not sure why I typed in GitHub repo and it did throw this weird uncontrolled issue. Maybe we should look into that GitHub. GitHub repo is a field. Language is a field. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why that thing uh, threw a warning there. It kind of concerns me. Let me just do a hard refresh and try it again. Okay, it's gone now. That's kind of weird. Okay, so at this point, when someone submits this form, we want to track all of the values that they've filled in and send that over to the back end. So how can we do that? We are going to basically find that on submit function here. And instead of console logging the values, we want to basically to do um, invoke a server action to store the data in our database. Okay. So the cool thing about Next.js, um, which I kind of like, is the fact that you can create something called server actions. And those are functions that you can just invoke directly in your front end client code. And that's going to run some back end code. So I like to make like an actions file here. So I could say actions.ts. I don't think I need TSX there. I'm going to say actions.ts. And then at the top, I'll say use server. And then we are going to export a function. I think it needs to be async, so I'll export async function, and we'll call it create room action. I like adding the action suffix to my actions just so it's a, a little bit more clear. Um, but what this action needs to do is take in the data. So this could basically take in some room information, um, which again would have to be some of that data that we just talked about. And I think what we could do, so I'm going to go over to our schema. I'm going to say export type room capital like this i'll say room dot um i'll say type of room dot infer select i believe and so this is a way that basically allows you to in your front end code you can type some of the stuff that's going to be passed in i'm going to import that you hover over it notice it has user id name description language and github repo so that helps us not have to redefine types everywhere. And in fact, I can use um, an omit and I could just omit the ID. I think it was a user ID. Um, because when you first create a room, the user is going to send over the data, but you don't know what their user ID is and you don't want to trust what user ID they sent over. So the way that you can create records, and I believe you can say await DB 
dot. Make sure you import that. And let's look over here. I think you need to do insert and then you need to pass in the table like this. And then we're going to say values and then we're going to pass in that room. Um, we have to rename this a little bit. We'll call that room data. And I, this is complaining because I think it thinks that a user ID is required. So we will have to kind of figure out how to pass in a user ID. Okay. And that should insert into the database as everything works fine. We could test this out and come back and fix it up later because um, there is a little bit more we're going to have to do to figure out if we're authenticated when someone calls this server action. Okay, so on the front end side of things, we should be able to just invoke this server action directly. So I can just go ahead and say create room action and I'll import it directly into our client component. And what we need to do is pass in values, which should have the same exact type signature and it should match that room that we created. And uh, if everything worked fine, um, if you're a fan of doing like awaits and async awaits, you could just go ahead and like do that. And then we can say, let's redirect to the home page. So how do you redirect? Well, in the top of this file here, the top of the form, I'll say const router is equal to use router. Import that from next navigation. And then I'm going to say router dot push. We want to go to the home page. So this will create the form. It'll wait for the room to uh, be created. When that's persisted to the database, we redirect the user back to the home page. And there's more stuff you can do for like optimistic updates and like loaders and spinners. We'll probably come back and try to do that in a, a little bit. But let's just focus on the key thing of like, how do we get this data inserted? So let's go back to our app and let's just test it out. I'm gonna go ahead and say my room is uh, working on dev finder. And then I'm gonna go ahead and say description is a cool application where you can pair program with random people online. GitHub repo, I don't have one, so let's just go ahead and type some random stuff in. And then I'll say TypeScript for the primary language. So let's test this out, Mono Truth. If I click Submit, um, must contain at most 50 characters. Okay, let's, let's change that. I'll do 250. And click Submit. There we go. All right, so this one aired out. It's saying insert or update on table room violates foreign key constraint room user ID, user ID FK. So the issue is, is that we actually need to pass in a real user ID. Remember that to do that we added in? We have to actually do this correctly. And so the way that you can validate the session and make sure that the user who's making the request is actually logged in, we could go back to, I think, um, I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to make a new file inside of this called auth.ts. And we're going to go ahead and say export function git server session. And then we can just go ahead and call a method. I'm going to rename this to git session. And then we're going to go ahead and import git server session. So this is a method from next auth you can use to basically get the server session. Now, the second thing we have to pass this is going to be your auth config. Now we made the auth config over here. This is the auth config. So technically I should probably pull this out and I'm going to just put it here. I'm going to say export const auth config is equal to this. We might have to reimport some stuff and rearrange some stuff. So we'll do that. And uh, make sure you import DB. Import that, import that. We're going to go back to the route and we actually want to import the auth config from a centralized place so that we don't have this like duplicated everywhere. And then also in auth, we're going to pass an auth config here so that when they call get session from our action, it knows how to connect to Postgres using drizzle. Okay. So now going back to the action, let's just go ahead and say const session is equal to get uh, await get session and I'll import that. Okay. And we should get back a session if it's defined, hopefully. And if not, we should get back null. So let's save this. Go back. I'm going to go ahead and just click submit here. And notice that it did print out the object. So we know we're logged in um, because that's defined. So using the session, remember, we need to get the user ID. So let's just go ahead and say session.user.user. 
oh wait, there's no user ID. So we have to kind of do some additional configuration in next auth so that we know what the user ID is of the user making the request. Now, to be honest, I don't remember this off the top of my head. I have messed with Drizzle in next auth before. So I'm gonna copy some code over and I'll kind of explain it to you. So over here, I'm gonna paste in the session strategy JWT. There's basically two ways you can use authentication. There's session or there's JWT. Um, JWT is necessary if you wanna use middleware, which we might end up using on this project. So I'm gonna go ahead and just bring that in. And then we're gonna bring over these callbacks. So callbacks allow you to define custom logic for when a user tries to sign in or register. And so you can kind of get and look up the user based on their email here. And so what this code is doing is like when you try to log in for the first time, it's going to take your token and it's going to try to find a user who's matching your token's email. Okay. And then, I mean, obviously if there's no user, we throw an error. And then we return this object that has the same information that the session had before, but now we also have a user ID, which is what we were missing in our action. Okay. So this is how you can do this. Second thing that this thing is not typed correctly. So let's just go ahead and give this a satisfies as a, uh, yeah, the, the entire auth config. We want to make sure that it satisfies auth options so that it knows what token and user is. Okay. Um, so for session.user, what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to say, let this equal to, I'm going to do this, the ID of this. And we'll say name, email, and image. Okay, so that should hopefully just overwrite the user object and just let it have all this stuff. Um, it's complaining about ID, and that's because we need to overload the default type of next auth. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this as well. Go ahead and auto import some stuff and uh, there you have it. All right, so now going back to our actions file, um, what we wanna do is we wanna say, if there is no session, we're gonna throw a new error. You must be logged in to create this room like this. And then otherwise you can just kind of run the logic. So here we should have session dot user dot ID. Notice that ID is now defined. That's the whole reason why we like went to the other file and had to configure everything else again. So let's see if this will at least throw an error or give us a uh, insert a record for us. Let's go back. I'm going to go ahead and just um, sign in again because it cleared out my user after changing all that stuff. <clears throat> go ahead and sign in. And I'm not going to type a full description here. I'm just going to go ahead and type in some stuff. Click submit. And what happened? You must be logged in to create this room. So I think to use a JWT style um, strategy, I mean, we do have to import a next auth secret thing. So this is what it's going to use to sign the JWT. If you don't understand how this works, it's should be fine. Um, so we are going to add that to the sample as well. Make this something secret. All right, so let's let's try it again. Let's go back to the app, click Submit. Um, we are gonna try, oh, we have to sign back in. Let's sign in here, do this. Make sure we're signed in. And we just type in some random stuff. And I click Submit. And it did redirect us back to the homepage. Go ahead and just refresh and see if the data shows up. All right, so going back to Drizzle Studio, which by the way, whenever you like run a migration script, sometimes you do have to restart Drizzle Studio. Um, so if you restart it, you can refresh it and you'll see that we have account room session testing user, all this stuff is showing up. And if we look at room, notice that it's showing up now. So we're going to go full circle. We're going to go back to our main page here. And what we want to do is instead of querying this testing table, we're going to query room and we're going to get back all the rooms. We'll say rooms, we'll say room. And then we want the, definitely the room ID, which um, we should probably add an auto incrementing room ID to this. So we'll probably have to fix that, but we can at least do something like this, which means that we can go back to our UI and refresh and notice that our room information does show up for us, which is nice. So let us fix that. I think I need to go to the schema 
Now, instead of using an auto incrementing column, I might actually just grab this. I think this will generate a UID for us automatically. And we could just put this here. I could say ID is this. And then we will import UID, call this ID. We'll say generate random UID. And then this will be not null primary key. I think this is how you might be able to do it. Um, I'm going to go to Drizzle Studio. I do want to delete this one. Uh, for, I can't even delete this. So what I'm going to do is just try to run DB push like that. And yep, add that in. Refresh this page. And there you have it. Now we have a unique ID for that record. And we can kind of use that. Um, over here on the page, so instead of doing room name, we'll say ID. I think we made a lot of code changes. We're going to go back and just make sure that we're not missing anything. We have an error here. ID is missing. So I think what we want to do is omit um, ID as well. I think that's how you do it. And then this will automatically give us an ID when the room is created. And that should be good. So let's go ahead and... I think we should commit. We did a lot of code changes, a lot of stuff going on. And um, yeah, hopefully you guys aren't lost because honestly I was getting lost at some points as well. So I'll go ahead and add all this and then we will say switching to ADT strategy. I'm adding ID to the session and creating the room when submitting the form. Go ahead and submit that. So now at this part, what I would like to do is probably just start making this application look a little nicer. So let's start with the header. Let's style it out a little bit and let's pretend like we have like a logo for this application. Um, also the metadata up here, create next app. We should probably update that. So let's go to our layout. I believe we have some metadata that's defined here and we are going to just go ahead and change this to be dev finder. That could be in the title. And then the description will be an application to help Pair program with random devs online. Okay, so let's make sure that updates. Dev finder does pop up. That's good. Second thing, let's work on the header. So let's go and find our header component. All right. And again, like I use command P. Fuzzy search is your best friend when it comes to coding. Command P, type in the component name and press enter in case um, you guys were just confused how fast I just loaded up that file. Very, very good to learn that shortcut. So in the header itself, on the left, we want a logo probably. And on the right, we want all of this sign in and sign out button stuff. So for positioning the logo and then like these actions, what we could do is we can get this a flex and we can say justify between. And what we also need to do is I'm actually gonna cut this out and I'm gonna put this on a div, right? So we're gonna have the header as a top level element. And then on the div itself, we're actually gonna move some of the stuff in here. And then for logo, I'm just going to wrap another div. And so what justify between does is like, it's going to put spacing between these two divs. So you'll see ones at the far left now. And then we also have the stuff in the far right. Let's go ahead and right here, I'll say class name. We want to do a container, right? The issue with what we have right now, if you zoom out really far, notice that like, I know you can probably not even see it, but if you're on a 4k monitor, like this layout is just keeps on expanding. It's not the best user experience. So typically, you want to put a container and an MX auto on like the outer header so that even if you keep zooming out, this thing will stay inside a container of the page. Um, because with a very, very large monitor, it's just, it looks terrible. S second thing we should probably do is we could change the header color a little bit. So if we're in dark mode, I will say dark and then we'll say BG. We could probably say like gray of 900. Let's kind of test that out. Okay, we got a little bit of a different color here just to kind of differentiate that. And then you'll see the vertical alignment for the logo. We want to make sure everything in here is vertically aligned. So we can say item center on that div and that'll vertically align it. And then also we can either add a fixed height to the header or we could just add some padding inside of it. Um, so maybe even padding Y of 12. That was way too much. Um, let's do padding Y of two maybe. Okay, so now we have a decent looking header, maybe even more padding than that, like a four. There we go. All right, so now if you go to light mode, we probably want to also make sure that we change the styling to be 
BG Gray 50. Okay, again, in Tailwind, if you prefix it with dark, then that's going to only apply to dark mode. Otherwise, this is like the default. So now, if you look at this, it's kind of be 100 would be a little bit better. There you go. So now, if I go back to dark and light mode, we can kind of style those independently as needed. Some additional things we should probably do is um, instead of the sign out button being this jarring, it's like it's pretty taking up all the real estate, right? We could instead have this be an account drop down. So again, we need a drop down. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this code. And inside the header itself, one thing you can do is I'll just say function out drop down. And then I'm going to return all this. And I'm going to copy this and just paste it in the top. Now, I will say, like, when I do tutorials, I try to walk you through, like, okay, how do you use Tailwind to style some of this stuff? How do you use Shad CN to bring in these different components? But as you get more familiar with this, I would recommend just signing up for, like, a Tailwind component system that has, like, your header already styled. So you don't have to waste a bunch of time, like, doing this tedious stuff. That's just me. Maybe you really enjoy, like, custom styling all this stuff, but... Uh, I would rather just have a header that I can just copy and paste and be ready to work on. So here is the drop down. And so what I want to do is I want to wrap uh, my name inside the drop down itself. So uh, we have the account drop down. What we could do is I'm going to paste this over here. And then we will take this and we're going to move it into the drop down itself. Okay, so instead of it saying open here, I'll put my name. And we don't have session, so we can go ahead and cut that out and put it right there, like this. Um, we still want session, so I'm just gonna go ahead and also import it here. And the reason I'm importing it in two different places is that this makes this a nice, like, it, it makes refactoring easy. I can cut this into another file and everything will work perfectly fine. If you wanna just prop drill it in, you could do that, and like this could take in session or something. But I think it's fine just to, you know, that's why we have hooks. Hooks make it very nice and composable to just bring in reusable code. So now, if you click on this, it shows the drop down. And so what I'm trying to do is I want to move the sign out button into an option here. Okay, so let's just go ahead and move this whole button. And then we're going to put it over here. And then if the data is defined on the session, um, I could also say is logged in. That might make it a little bit easier. I'll double negate that or cast that to a Boolean. And if you're if, and then so I'm going to say is logged in, then we're going to have the sign out button. Now, instead of doing a button here, we actually want to drop down menu item. So let's just go ahead and paste in the drop down menu item. It'll say sign out. We're going to take this on click method and we'll put it right there. We'll do the same thing for sign in. And we'll make sure we take the right code here. That we sign in. And uh, yeah, it should be good. Delete these other options, and we don't need this my account thing. I'll just go ahead and delete that in the separator. All right, so now you hover over it. It says sign out, but it'll be nice if there's an icon here. So let's go to lucid.dev, and let's try to find like a sign out. Okay, there's lo it's called log out. So let's do here, we'll say log out icon like this. And then over here, we'll say log in icon. Okay, let's check this out. Click it. It says sign out. Pretty cool. We should probably add a couple of styling. So I'm going to add some. Here you could just add some margin right of two to this logout icon like this. And then uh, actually do this as well. All right, so now it says sign out. Pretty cool. Um, I will say that I want to put a little bit of space in between these things. And also it doesn't seem very vertically aligned. Then we could also change this whole thing to like have a button style because right now it doesn't seem like it's clickable. So on the drop down trigger over here, I think you could say as child, and we're going to add a button like this. We're going to go ahead and paste this in, and hopefully a button will show up now. It says my name, and then what I can also do is we'll give this a variant of outline. Here we go. Now you can play around with it. Maybe there's something else we should use. Like maybe you should use the link. Okay. I think that's a little bit better. Uh, what we could also do inside the button, we need to display the image of the user. So let's go ahead and bring in next image. Okay. Like this. 
And we're going to go ahead and import source. And that should be able to be pointing to session, data, user, and I think we have like an, an image. Okay, we'll do this. And then we can just hard code some width of like 50 and see how it looks. We'll do 50, we'll say height of 50. And then uh, alt. Alt will be uh, your avatar. Now that I think about it, ShadCN actually has an avatar component. So I think it'd be better if we go back to ShadCN, we find avatar. Okay, looks like this. We can go ahead and just import this avatar. Otherwise, you're going to have to do some like styling and rounding of the image and stuff like that. So if we have a component that already does that for us, let's just go ahead and import it. Okay, I'm going to paste that avatar in right there. And then we're going to figure out how to use it. You use it like this. So let's just go ahead and copy that whole thing in and paste it in. And then for source, we're going to go ahead and just paste this. And a lot of the stuff we can go away now. Like we didn't need to do all that. I apologize for even doing that in the first place. The issue is that the image could potentially be undefined. So I'm going to make it fall back on an empty string. And if it's not defined, you have this fallback thing here, right? And so technically you could put like the initials of the user. We, we know the name is right here, right? So you could put the initials here, but let's see if does this work. Let's go to our app and here you go. Secondly, let's put a little bit of gap in between the image and my name. Different ways you can do that. I mean, you could just do some margin. Uh, like this. Sometimes I like just using a flex and a gap or space X. And then for this, uh, notice how this is not like vertically aligned. It's kind of weird looking. So what we want to do is we want to find where the mode toggle is. And here we probably want to say flex item center gap of four. Okay, there we go. Looks a little bit better. Again, I'm just trying to teach you all how to do this. I would try to find like a pre-made component you don't have to waste your time doing all this. Um, all right, so now we got Dev Finder. It would be cool if we had like a nice icon up here. I'm gonna go to my own icongenerateai.com application that I worked on. This is another site that I kind of uh, worked on a while back. And I wanna make a magnifying glass with a computer. Okay, we'll just go ahead and use, I don't know, Cyan. We'll do Dolly 3, because it just it's gonna look much better. And what should we do for the style? Let's just do pop art and let's, generate an icon and see if it looks pretty good. Yeah, I mean, it looks pretty fun to me. So let's just go ahead and download this. we will just call it icon. We're gonna click on this and we're gonna go to quick actions. I will say, convert the image, because we do want it to be a PNG and we want it to be a little bit smaller because right now it's huge, like two megabytes or something like that. And then we're gonna go over here and we're gonna say quick actions, remove background. And then I should be able to copy this and we're gonna go to our dev finder project. We're gonna go to public and we'll paste that in. So now we should be able to access that icon up here and we are going to go ahead and say image and now we can actually use react image or sorry next image i'm going to say source and then i believe you can say public slash icon.png same thing with the width we could do i don't know 80 it could be 80 alt could be the application icon of a magnifying glass there we go um actually i don't think we need public there i think i can just say icon there we go popped up now, obviously, we want this to be on the same line. So flex, gap of two, item center. There we go. And then it's also pretty big. So let's just go ahead and reduce this to like 60. And the text itself, I'm going to say text of extra large. This is how you can kind of change your text size in Tailwind. There you go. So second thing you should do is when you have a header, the top left logo and the name should always be clickable. So we can wrap this entire thing in a link. So if I go over here, say this is a link, and then I'm going to wrap this. Okay, so this is how you can use Next.js links. And we're going to go ahead and say href is equal to the home page. So if I, was, if I were to be on any other page and I click this, it'll take us back to the home page. Now I did mess up the styling there. I think maybe uh, I could just move this whole class thing to the link. Okay, and then we can delete the div. I don't think the div is needed. And then also some hover state. So if you hover over this thing, maybe we should change the styling of it. So I'm going to say hover. That is a Tailwind uh, directive, I guess you could say, which is going to, or I guess it's called a pseudo selector. And if you hover over this thing, I'm going to go ahead and just make the text 
gray of 100. Let's just see how this works. Or we can make it a color. This is a blue of 800. Okay, that's a little too dark. That'd probably fail contrast. Again, remember, whenever you do stuff like this, switch it over to light mode. Make sure that it still looks good. Notice that this is not even legible anymore. So these are some of the things you have to keep in mind, which is why probably just doing an underline might be a little bit better. So instead, I'm going to say hover. I'll say text uh, underline. Actually, I think you can just say underline. And uh, there you go. I do think there's a little bit too much padding on this thing. I'm going to make it padding Y of 2 again, just to reduce that. And secondly, if someone wants to upload, a, create a room, um, you could potentially put a link in the header for that, or we could just start working on this home page. Uh, for right now, I'm not going to do a landing page. Maybe we'll do it later, but I just want to try to query the data back from the back end. Remember, we have like that page that has the form that creates the room. Now we need to basically allow the user to get back to that page. So we could add a button up here or something to navigate to that create form page. So that's what I'm going to do. I think the header is good enough. Like I'm not going to waste too much time making this header perfect. But how do we, let's go to the page here. How do we actually allow a user to navigate to that create room form page here? Um, so let's just start with a button. Just add a button here. I'm going to go ahead and say create room and then I'm going to import this button okay awesome create room it shows up and then I'm going to put that on the far right I just want to make it live over here and then also over here I want to put a title so let's just go ahead and add an h1 here and I'll say find dev rooms save that it shows up awesome probably want to make this be like a text for Excel and we want to wrap this whole thing in a div like this. And I'm going to say give a class name of flex justify queen item center. Now the justify between didn't work. Sometimes you have to go and inspect, figure out why this thing did not expand to the full width. Now I've seen issues where I think this is like a flex column. And since we're using a flex column here, technically I think you have to say like W full. Um, technically, we don't even need flex column here, so let's just get rid of flex column, and then we can get rid of the W full, and then something is making them go all center, so we don't want that. And then additionally, justify between probably needs to go away too. Honestly, I don't know why you have flex there either. Let's just get rid of flex. Um, this looks pretty good. Padding a little bit high. I think I might even do like a 16. That might look a little bit better. And so again, what we're doing is if you click on this create room, button it should take you to that page so how do you redirect to a page well i think you could just add a link here like this and i'm going to go ahead and wrap create room that they as child on the button and then this is going to take us to create room this as child thing is very important to understand when using shad cn basically it says hey treat this as like the parent dom node but then apply all the styles of what a button would be onto this. So now like if you were to look at the DOM, there's really just a link on the page, right? But it has all the styles of your button. So it kind of like passes all the styles down to whatever is nested inside of that first child. So if you click on it, it should take you to the Create Room page. Very awesome. Now one thing that you might have noticed is when I clicked on Create Room, it took like a second for Next.js to navigate us to that new page. Honestly, I don't know why it's so slow sometimes, but I would say it'd be a better user experience if we had like a loader bar pop up. So let me show you a really cool package that I like to use on my side projects, and that is Next.js Top Loader. So let's just go ahead and install this bad boy over here. Go ahead and install that. It's very easy to get set up. You basically just import it into your layout. So, you know, copy and paste coding. That's all we do these days. And then we're going to add Next Top Loader. We're going to put it right here above the header. Honestly, it doesn't really matter where you put it. I think you could technically put it like above the body if you wanted to. Okay, so now we're getting our first weird bug with Drizzle in Postgres. So when you're dealing with a MySQL database, there's usually a limit of how many open connections you can have. But in Next.js, every time you save a file, it kind of like restarts your server and it reopens a brand new connection. And so we're like using up all of the connections and we get this weird error where we could fix it by basically killing our Next.js server and restarting it. 
But a better approach, I think, is you Google the error, and this is a dev only issue due to hot module reloading. So he's saying you could basically do something like this inside of that database file where you only want to, you kind of like cache the, the DB object. Kind of sucks that you have to do this, honestly. So let's just see if we can kind of pull this in and figure out uh, what to do with this. So let's go to the DB file, let's go to index, and we're going to paste that all in. Some of the stuff we don't need, like we don't need that, we don't need that. We could probably pull this to the top. Um, let's declare the global here. And let's keep looking. So they make a let here. Definitely want that. We'll put it up there. And then if node env is production, we don't want to do this stuff. Process. Kind of just like keep doing this. Okay. Same thing here. Go ahead and paste that in. Don't think we need this anymore. I think we want to take this and we want to pass it as a an argument to here. Probably delete that. This. I definitely like doing curly braces all the time, so I'm going to add those curly braces in. And we're getting like a little TypeScript error, so I think what's happening is that this needs to be um, type of schema. And then also here, process.env node. This is something that you'll run into also with other ORMs. Like this isn't just a drizzle issue. This is a next issue where you have an ORM that's connecting and recreate, recreating database connections every time you refresh the page. I've seen this issue happen with uh, Prisma as well. So just keep that in mind. Typically you have to do that type, type of stuff. Um, let's go back to our app and let's see if it uh, works now. Yeah, it's definitely super broken. So I do need to just like stop my next app and just restart it. But now we should never run into the issue again. And that's real life coding for you. You think you did everything good and then you run into weird issues. You got to go Google, find solutions, and we're good. So again, what were we doing? We were adding a Next.js top loader. The reason is because if you click on this link, you're going to see a nice loader pop up here that just lets the user know that like, hey, your app is still loading. Just be patient. You also see a loader up here in the top right. So I think it just adds a nice little like feedback to users and it just makes your app look a little bit more professional. So the next steps is we want to display all of the rooms that people have created. So when this page loads, we actually already get the rooms, right? Right here, we map over all the rooms. It just looks pretty bad. It just says ASDF, and I had no idea what that was. So what we could do instead is let's go to ShadCN, and there's a card component. I like using cards. Um, they're just nice to kind of display information. So let's go ahead and install the card. I don't think we have a card yet. So let's load up a new tab here. Let's go to the bottom. I'll install the card. That's done. And now we can go ahead and make a new component. So let's just go up here. I'll say function. And we will call it the room card. Go ahead and return that information there. And then I'm going to go ahead and copy this and paste it up here. Now I do want to kind of give you a little tip and trick. I like to just put components and functions inside the same file until either A, the file just becomes super long, or B, I find it more beneficial to move it out to a separate shared component. I don't like just putting all my components inside this components folder unless they are used in more than one place. If something is not used in more than one place, I would highly recommend just keep it as close as possible to like the page that's using it or the header that's using it, etc. Anyway, we have a room card here. And what we want to do is we want to display the room card instead of divs. So I should be able to save this. Um, instead of passing children though, we're going to have to pass something else. What we need to pass in is probably the name of the room. So I'm going to go ahead and just put some props here. I'll say this will be like the room. Um, actually, technically, we could just get the room type. So I'm going to say room is A. And I forgot how to get that schema. So if we go to schema, we do have a type of room here. So let's just go ahead and bring in that room, auto import that. And now we should have access to room dot name. And then down here, we'll say room is equal to just pass in that room object. So now the room card has access to like whatever it needs on that room data structure. 
and it just makes our life a little bit easier. So let's go back to our UI, and this is what a card looks like. Also, we can switch back to light mode, make sure it looks good. Okay. Now, I would probably say let's put some padding or margin underneath the fine rooms row. So let's go back to here. In this whole section here, we just want to say like margin bottom of 12. Push it down a little bit. Even, even maybe 8. White space is like super important. You need to understand like the concepts of white space. How much space should you put behind or between like relative things. Anyway, this is, but I won't get into designing. I'm not really a design expert. We also have a description we could display. So let's go back to our card. And we'll say room dot description. There you go. And I really wish I named these better than ASD <laughs> ASDF, but it's fine. Now for the content, what we could put here is maybe like the GitHub URL. So I'm just going to go ahead and put like a link. A link. And then we will just go ahead and say github project we'll href this to room.href i'm sorry it's called the uh, github repo this is potentially nullable right so we don't want to display this unless it's defined so i'm just going to go ahead and say like if this thing is defined we'll display a link and then we can also add in a github icon which for some reason that's deprecated i don't know why they deprecated that from their project I have to go and read the documentation of that. Anyway, on the link, let's just go ahead and give this a class of flex item center gap of two. That. Cool. Now, if you click this, it'll take you to the page, but we don't want to like have it change our current URL. We want it to load up a new tab. So how do you do that? Well, on the link itself, you can say, I think it's target. And you can say blank. And then you also need like this no referral thing. Or else you'll get like some security issues. Now if I click this, it'll load up a new tab to your project if you have a project set up, which we don't. And then for the footer, we could probably just put a button here. So let's go down to the footer. Instead of a paragraph tag, we will say button. And we will say join room. There you go. And then uh, this could also be a link. So we'll say as child. We'll say this is a link. This. The link needs to go to a rooms slash. In our case, we're going to pretend like we have a route. We haven't created this route yet, but that's probably the next logical step of what we need to do. And we're going to interpolate a string here. And we'll say room dot uh, ID. So now if you click on this, it'll redirect us to that room. And then you can actually start setting up your live camera and talking to someone else who might be sharing their screen which should be pretty cool to uh, get going. So also, if we were to create multiple rooms here, let's create one more. I'll say, um, working on Dev Finder, an application to help developers pair program with random developers online. I'm trying to record a video for this. Okay, so nice description, GitHub link. Let's actually find one. Let's just go ahead and put the dev finder link here. And then primary language, I'll say TypeScript. Just go ahead and submit this. So notice after we create the room, it's not showing up on our landing page, homepage. And this is because Next.js, when you deal with server actions, you need to make sure that you tell Next.js to clear out the cache so that when a user were to hit your homepage again, they can see all of the rooms that you've created, right? So let's go back to that modal. Remember we made an actions.ts file? So what we want to do in this actions.ts file is after you've inserted this into your database, you can call something called revalidate path. And then you basically can put whatever URL that you want to tell Next.js to like, you need to just clear the cache so that next time someone hits that page, they will get a fresh copy of everything. There's also another way you can do it. Basically, you could like have the UI do a force refresh and that'll kind of clear out your cache as well. But this is kind of the way that they recommend it. Second thing I think we're going to run into when you deploy this to production is if I were to go to, where's my page? Let's go to page here. When this page loads right now, this is a statically built page. So if I were to actually go here and say npm run build, 
you'll see something very interesting. It's going to treat this as a static page, which means when you deploy this to production, it's never going to update. It's always going to show like a hard-coded list of rooms. Not what you want, right? That's definitely not what we want. And what we're going to do instead is we're going to mark this entire page as dynamic. Right here, if you see if it's a circle, it is going to be a static page, and we want this to have a lambda symbol. So a couple of ways we can do this. Now, the first thing I would recommend doing um, is inside of the source directory, honestly, I would just put like a, I don't know, you can call it repository, You can I can call it data. I like to call it data access. Um, some people call it services, but I'll say data access. And I'm gonna make a file to abstract away this. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just say rooms.ts. And then we're gonna go ahead and just say export function it rooms. That's going to call that method. It's going to return rooms. And then I'm gonna just go ahead and say export async. We wanna import the data base. So let's go ahead and just make sure we have that imported like this. But why we did this is because, first of all, it's good to abstract away your front end from like where your data is coming from. So I'm gonna go ahead and call get rooms like this. And now our front end code doesn't know that we even are using Drizzle. It doesn't know that we have a table called rooms. It just knows that it needs to call a method. And one layer of abstraction is actually really good to do. So keep in, get into the habit of doing something like this. Let's go to get rooms. And again, we're still gonna have the issue with the caching. So how do you work around the caching? You say no store. Now this is an unstable method, whatever unstable means, but this is the way that Next.js docs actually recommend that you mark a function as dynamic so that if any of your components or the component tree depends on that, it'll mark the entire route as dynamic as well. Okay, so I'm gonna rerun npm run build just so that you're kind of aware of that caveat because this will totally make you waste a bunch of time unless you understand it. And now notice that this is now considered a dynamic page and we won't have issues when we go live with our app. I probably have to restart my next server because when you do an npm run build with next, it'll just mess up your next server because um, they both share the same like build directory. All right, let's go ahead and refresh this. Now it should look good. And let's try it one more time because we want to make sure that, that little bug doesn't actually happen. So I'm going to go to create room. In this case, I am just going to go ahead and just like do a bunch of this stuff. I'll click submit and notice that it does show up. So now that we have three rooms here, it would be nice if we styled these to be side by side in like columns. So pretty easy to do. Basically, we can make this whole thing be a grid. Wrap this whole thing in a grid and we'll say grid calls of three. Okay, now we have cards that are side by side. And what we could do is we could also say gap of four. Okay, space them out a little bit, just makes it look a little bit better. Go ahead and check out dark mode, should be good. Now, honestly, I don't like how these join room buttons are like offset. It'd probably be good to add some type of like fixed height to either here or add some like flex. I'm not gonna get into that though, I'm not, because I do wanna like focus more on the functionality, not the styling. So I think we made some good progress. There's some things I'd probably nitpick about this UI, but I'm not gonna focus too hard in that. What we wanna do, is we want to start working on the ability for someone to join rooms and share their webcam or share their screen and have other people join those as well. So you can have people collaborate with random strangers online and develop on the same project. But let's commit what we have so far before we kind of get down that rabbit hole. I'm going to go ahead and commit everything and I'll say working on displaying all of the rooms on the homepage. Sync that up. All right, so let's start working on the room page. So if I go ahead and click join room, you'll see in the top URL, we have room slash a UID. Now currently this page is failing because we haven't created a page for it. So let's go here, I'm gonna say room. Actually, I need to call it rooms, I believe. Let's see, yeah, rooms. And the way in Next.js, you can handle dynamic data. We've already done it with the API, maybe you didn't notice it, is the brackets. So inside of rooms, I can just go ahead and say, make a new folder called room ID. And then I can make a page like this. And now let's just go ahead and say export default async function. And uh, we're going to call this room page like that. For now, we'll just return a div and then we'll kind of like add in some stuff. Awesome. So the first thing we're going to need to do 
is definitely get the room ID. How do you get the room ID? Well, you'll have props that are passed in. If I were to go ahead and just like console log these props, you will be able to see what these are set as. Um, now, I don't know where that console log is going to... Well, for some reason, I got to do this. So the console log, I think it happens on the server side of things. So let's go to our server and notice that we have params, which has a room ID. So remember in Next.js, when you have an asynchronous page, it's going to be server rendered. Okay, so here we can say room ID is equal to props.params.room ID. And there you have it. Now, I personally like to type these things. So I would say params room ID like this, so that it's perfectly typed and we don't have an any on the top there. Uh, we don't need the console anymore. So now we know what the room ID is. Let's just go ahead and display it. Go back and you can see the room ID popping up down here. Now you're asking why do we need this room ID? Well, we have to fetch the data. If someone were to bookmark a room or share a link with a friend, we don't know the title and the description and all the other metadata that might be attached to a room. So we're going to have to fetch that from the database. So that's the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out how do we get the room information. Let's say const room is equal to get room, room ID. Now this is a method we haven't created yet. But remember, we just made that folder called data access. It has a file called rooms. Let's just go ahead and load this up. I'm going to say get room. We'll take in a room ID. And then we could basically say room.find first. Now, to be honest, I'm going to load up the drizzle docs because I don't remember how to find first. So it says you can do the query, the table.find mini. Also, find first, which does uh, this. Is there a example of where you can do a where clause? Yeah, so you can do something like this. Let's try this. I'll say find first where, and then we're going to do this equal function. And then we're going to say where room dot. I think I need to import room from the schema. And I'll say yeah, where room dot ID is equal to room ID. So the pattern is a little bit different from like Prisma. Um, they have like this builder object where I think you can continue to like add things onto this or you could do like an and maybe, I don't know. But we'll just, we'll figure it out. We have the docs. Don't be scared to just go look to the docs to figure out how to do stuff. But now we have a method we can call that should get back the room. Um, I would probably like to call this instead of rooms, I'll call it like something else. But the issue is that this is called room. Um, you know what? I could just return here. We don't even need to do any of this. Just return. That'll give us back the room and we should be good. So now if we auto import this from data access, we should be able to display the room dot name. Let's go back to our app. Notice that the room name pops up. Now, I would rather click on like this one. This one would probably be better working on Dev Finder. Now, the way I envision this working is we could have the actual like screen sharing happening over here. And then we could have maybe some room metadata displayed on the right. Maybe even a chat. I don't know if I'm going to do a chat in this application, but let's let's try doing that. Um, let's go ahead and try to split this left and right. So I'm going to go ahead and... Um, make a div and then I'll say class name is equal to grid calls maybe we could do four I'm also going to give this a grid you also do flex it just depends on what you want to do um, grid just sometimes is easier sometimes grid is easier than flexbox sometimes flexbox is easier than grid so we'll find out this will work for our needs so we do want a on the left we're going to make a div and this will be the, for the video player we're, we're not going to do yet we're going to figure out how to do that in a bit but we do want to display another panel, and this will be like the info panel. Okay, so if we were to look at this, we want the video player to have more real estate, like more width than the, the panel, right? So different ways you could do this. If you use flex, you could just give this thing up like a hard-coded width and then maybe give this a flex grow. But since we're using grid, we could say all span three, I believe. Now this will make the video player expand up to three columns and then we have the panel on the right. Okay, second thing we want to do is on this entire thing, this div, we could go ahead and say min h is screen and then so that you guys can visualize what's going on, 
I'm going to give this a blue. I'm going to give this a class name of BG Red 400. Because right now it's not very easy to visualize. And we could probably give this whole thing a height of 100. So here I'll say H of 100, or H of full, I mean, height of full. That should expand it, maybe. I think there's like a, something going on here where it's not expanding all the way. That's full H screen, min H screen. This is a grid. You know, if I actually said in, in H screen here, would that help it? Yeah, that works. I'm going to actually get rid of this one. And there we go. All right, so first of all, I'm going to put a little bit of gap between these things. And then secondly, we could probably make these like be divs with like a drop shadow. So inside a video player, I actually want this to have like a card inside of it. And then probably info panel could also be a card too. So let's go ahead and wrap this in another div. And I'll say like drop shadow. Is that what it is? Drop shadow large. Let's try that. I'll say video player. And then for right now, I'll say BG orange 400. Okay, so what we're actually going to do is I'm going to give this a BG white of 50 for right now, maybe even 100. And then inside of this wrapper here, I'm going to go ahead and just give it some padding. So I'll say padding of like 8. There we go. I don't know why BG white disappeared. Oh, because BG white is not a color. I should say BG gray. There we go. Maybe you can give it some rounding. So I'll say rounded. That's how you can make the corners be a little bit rounded. And then inside of the actual card itself, I can give this some padding of 12 as well. Okay, so we got a nice floating card. Same thing with the info panel. Let's just go ahead and copy all this. And we will just go ahead and just say info panel. This will be video player. Now the issue with the info panel is, uh, I should say call span one. There you go. So a little bit of tweaks. We could probably like reduce the size of this. I think I have like um, too much padding going on for these. So I'll just say like a two, maybe even a four. This could be a four. And then why is this so much padding there? I think this is like, I'm gonna make this red again. So it's the padding. So technically, if you don't want that much space here, you could just remove some of the padding of either the red or the blue column. I might remove it on the blue, so padding right at zero. Or maybe even padding right at one. I think it's like removing the, the shadow. Or maybe two, and this could be padding left to two. Okay. And then let's just remove these colors. The colors were just so you can visualize what I'm trying to think. If we were to go back to what the cards look like, maybe we should just make them match the card style. The cool thing about Shad CN is you can just go to the card component and you can just grab literally this whole thing. And we want to make this be the styling of this. So let's just drop that in. This, make sure that looks like a card now. And I kind of wasted all that time styling that thing, but hey, at least you learned something with Tailwind maybe. Okay, so now we got a card over here and a card over here. I could have technically just wrapped it in a card. Anyway, that's good enough. So we need to put some information in the info panel. So let's go ahead and, first of all, the padding of 12 is way too much. I think it needs to be like a padding of four, maybe. And then in the info panel, we need to put the name of the room like this. Let's do an H1 for the name. The class name is text of extra large. Okay, maybe that's too much. I'll say base. And then we will say we'll have an H2 or a paragraph tag for the description. Okay, and then we'll say this will be like text gray of 700. Maybe even 600. Now for this, let's just go ahead and give this a flex. Flex call and a gap of four just to kind of space out some of the stuff. And then we could put a link to the actual GitHub repo, which I'm going to just go back to here and I'm going to grab this code, paste that in, auto import some stuff, auto import that one. Why not? 
and figure out why this is potentially undefined. So it's saying room could potentially be undefined, which depending on the interface you want for your function, you could have this throw an error if it's not defined, which might be good. Um, or you could have some type of like state here saying that, hey, if room is not defined, like if there's no room, let's just return no room of this ID found. There's different ways you can do error states in Next.js. I think this is the easiest approach um, instead of like having to do an error boundary personally. So we'll do it like that. So now if you were to go to some random ID, so let's change the last number to a four, no room of this ID found. There you go. Go to one that actually exists and it'll show up. GitHub project still shows up. And I think, was there something else we're storing on this? Um, room dot, what was that? We'll say room dot language. So, okay, here's an opportunity to bring in something interesting from Shad CN. There's something called toggles or like uh, badges, I mean. So let's go to badge and we're going to bring in something that looks kind of like this. Let's just go ahead and install that badge. Again, go to your terminal, paste it in. That'll start installing. We can just import the badge directly at the top. And then we want to probably put the, the language here. So we'll say badge like this. What's the interface for this? Uh, variant outline. So I think by default, it should look fine. Let's just go to that finder. And then it says TypeScript here. Now, the reason this is like full withing is because of the call, the flex column we're doing. If you want to get rid of that, I think you say w.fit, and that'll basically reduce the width to be like what size it was supposed to be. Okay. Now, technically, what we could do is we could make it more sophisticated for the tags. I think that would be actually pretty cool. If we were to go back um, to Drizzle Studio, actually, and for language, let's just assume that this is like a comma separated list of languages. So, like, I know my head is like hiding that. Let's just close that. We'll say TypeScript. What are some other cool things that we're doing? We'll say like Drizzle. Uh, we are doing Next.js, and we are also doing uh, Git Stream. Just save that. And now if we go back to our app and refresh, notice that we get that info, info back, but we could split it by the comma and like actually display that stuff. Again, this is just a hack. I think potentially you want to make like a, a tags table and then have some type of normalization between like your tags. This is just keeping it simple, right? Keep it simple. And we're going to go ahead and say tags is equal to room dot language. Actually, I'm going to say languages. And then we want to split by comma. And um, additionally, we probably want to loop through everything and trim any spaces. So I'm going to say map. I'll say language trim. There we go. AI came in clutch right there. And what that's doing is if someone were to create a room that has like spaces in between the commas, it'll still work. And now what we're going to do is we're going to loop over these like this. Go ahead and see if AI can help us just kind of do this or just do that. That should be fine enough. And um, I'm missing a parenthesis there. We want to put a key here and this key needs to be the language. Then we also just want to print out Lang here. Does that make sense? So now we have all these different badges for our languages. Now, technically, I should rename that from languages to something else. Like, these aren't languages anymore. These are like tags. And then we can put a comma here. That should be good. And then for all the badges themselves, we should have like a, a wrapper, which I think we could probably just say flex. Go ahead and wrap that there. And I'll say gap of two. And that should space them out. Now we do have to tell the styling that we want it to wrap when it goes off the screen like this. And um, I think it's like a flex wrap, you can say. Flex wrap, maybe. There we go. That should look pretty good. Tags is a little big. I might actually reduce that. Actually, I don't think we even need tags. It's kind of obvious what this is. These are tags, right? Um, and then we have the project here, which looks a little big as well. So like I might actually text center this and I'll say text is small. I'm not sure why the text center is not working. I can say self center. I should put it in the center there. You know, now that I think about it, let's just go ahead and move this whole thing up. I'm going to put it right underneath the title. 
got to be a better design. Or technically, you could just put an icon up here, you know? You you make it how you want it to be. So at, in the future, maybe we could do like you click on a tag and that'll take you to a page that shows all the other people who are coding on TypeScript or coding on Drizzle or coding on Next.js. But for right now, we'll just keep it basic. Um, one thing I do want to fix before we get into the video player part is if you go back and create a room uh, for the language, I'm going to rename this a little bit. We're going to do a little bit of refactoring here. And I'm going to rename this to tags. List your programming languages, frameworks, libraries, so people can find your content. Okay, let's just go ahead and do that. And um, we probably wanted to put a placeholder in this one, actually. I'm going to say placeholder is TypeScript, uh, Next.js, Tailwind. Okay, so people know that just by looking at the placeholder, this is a comma separated list of tags. Um, and now that I think about it, maybe the placeholder is a good idea. Maybe it is a good idea so that people know like what they need to put into here. So let's go back and I'm going to go to here. I'll say placeholder and I'll put a link to my GitHub. There we go. For description, we'll do the same thing. A placeholder. I'm working on a side project. Um, join me. And then finally for the name. Just the name of the project. They'll call it Dev Finder is awesome. Now, technically, we could probably get those tags displayed here as well. So, like at a top level, people can see what the tags are. So, I know I'm jumping around, but that's just the way like I like to teach. I don't like to have like a structure. I just kind of add things as I think that we need to add them. So, let's go back to where we do the, the, the tags, which where do we do that? That was over here. I called it languages, so I'm going to change it to tags real quick. I'll do a FN, F2, I'll say tags, that'll refactor it. I don't like how this is called language anymore. So we will go to the schema. We'll call this tags like this. And then we're going to have to write a, write a migration script. I'll call this tags, do that. And then I'm sure there's other places in our code base we're going to have to fix. But I'll say npm run db push. I should apply our changes. Now this gives us some options. Do you want to rename it or do you want to create a new column? I'm going to go ahead and say we want to rename the column and then execute everything. Go ahead and restart that. And I'm sure there's some places where we got to fix. So let's go find our TypeScript errors. This What is this complaining about? Oh, I think we call it language here. So this needs to be called tags. And I think our app should be happy now. Do that. Okay. Column language does not exist. Uh, do I have to restart my next app to get this to work? Seems like you have to for some reason, so. Okay, so the whole reason for that, I want to make sure I didn't break anything. Anytime you do a major refactoring like that, like just make sure you don't break anything. Uh, TypeScript node submit. Seems like it worked. If I go and view this, do we see those tags? Awesome. And like I said, I want to get the tags displayed here. So this is a good opportunity to make a reusable shared component. So let's go here and I'm going to make one called tags list esx and we can just go ahead and say export function tags list this needs to take in a list of tags and then somehow it needs to display them so how do we get those tags well we can just find out where we use them and i'll just copy this i'm going to return that whole thing import the badge here and now we can use that on our page. So I'm going to go ahead and just say tags list, pass in the tags. That, and we should be good. Just need to auto import that. So let's make sure we didn't break it. Let's go back to our main page. That's still displaying. Now I will say I don't like this approach to um, how we have to kind of like split and then trim. So we could add a utility function. 
probably honestly in that tags list component, we could just go and say export um, export function split tags. And then go ahead and just do that code there. I am using Copilot, so I don't want to type everything out. It's kind of a pain, but it's the same code. We're just going to go ahead and run split tags on that. And then you can kind of reuse this code. And then technically, we're not using this anywhere else, right? So we could, if you wanted to, just cut that, put it here. There you have it. You might ask, well, why didn't the component just run this logic? I'm trying to make the component not know about the way the tags are stored in the database. All it needs to take in is an array of strings. And it's a responsibility of the person calling or using this component. They need to figure out how to get that data in the format it needs. So now I can just go here and I'm going to go back to my main landing page. And somewhere in this card, probably underneath the description, uh, we could probably just put the tags in, right? Go ahead and import that. Go ahead and import that. Save it. Go back to our main page. And you see that those pop up. Now we do want to add a little bit of margin underneath the GitHub project. So we're going to go ahead and just say margin bottom of four. Push that down. There you have it. Um, I might swap them as well. I want the tags to show up first. So I'm going to go ahead and just cut this, put it down there. And then um, instead of doing the margin bottom, now that I think about it, we should probably just give this a class name, flex, flex call gap of four. And that should just space it for us. I would probably recommend doing flex or space X or space Y instead of doing margins. It's just, it's cleaner in my opinion. But yeah, so now we got some cool tags. Let's go back to the room. And I think this is pretty good. I think we're doing pretty well. Now for the video player part. So when you try to go to a room, we're going to be using something called GitStream.io. So this service allows you to basically create video calls and rooms and you know chat rooms as well i think it uses webrtc behind the scene but it kind of takes care of all that heavy lifting for you so i'm going to create a new app here and we're going to call it dev finder and we're going to say we want this to be in ohio because i'm on east coast chat data storage location us east let's go on existing app we're just going let's just create it You'll be given a key and a secret, and honestly, I'm going to go to the docs too, because if you've watched my tutorials, I like doing stuff live. So how do you do a video and audio call? So we will be using the video and audio feature of this. They have some other products as well, but let's just go to the video and audio, and then I'm going to go to the docs, and we're going to click on React. We'll view the React documentation. And they got some good information here on how to get this all set up. Let's go to installation. First thing we need to do is add it in. Okay, just go ahead and npm install that. So they give you some example code at how you can create a new room from the client side of things. And we'll have to get into more of like client authentication and stuff like that. So let's just grab this code and see if we can at least get a video player displayed. Okay, so let's go to our room and in this video player section, I'm going to make a new file here called video player TSX because I'm pretty sure we're going to want a client component for this. So I'm going to say use client and I'm going to say export function video. Um, I, I'm going to call this dev finder video because I think they called their components like video player and stuff like that. So first of all, let's uh, import some of the stuff. Oh yeah, let's just change the name of that, whatever. And I am going to change it to be functions. Okay. Delete this. And let's kind of look through here because there's some things that we're going to need, like API key. We're going to have to get an API key, which I think in our application that we set up, here is the API key right here. So let's just say process env next public get stream API key. And then we'll go to our env file which is here, I'll paste that in, and we wanna grab that, like this. So first of all, let's make sure that this is set so that we remember it. And then here, we're gonna set it just like that, double quote it. 
Cool. So now we need a user ID. In this case, we we know what the user ID is, I believe. Um, but we'll figure that in a bit. And then we also need an authentication token. Um, now, unfortunately, I think if we just try to use this in our app, like it's just going to not work too well with Next.js. So some of the stuff we only want to run when it's been mounted to the client. And the way you do that is you can use a use effect like this. You might say, well, wh why do we need this? You have use client up here. When Next tries to run and pass through like a route, it does its server-side rendering. And it's also going to dive into your client components and try to like render static assets for that too. So some of our stuff that we're sending up here, we want to use in a defining the use effect. So let's just go ahead and pull down some of this. Um, we could probably store the client. Yeah, so I'm going to say const client set client equals this. Uh, pull in use state here. And what is this complaining about? It's saying that this is potentially not assigned. So we want to make sure that we only do this um, when it's ready. So I'll just say when the client's ready, we'll do that. Uh, same thing with the call. We're going to have to say const call like that. And what does a, a call object have? It's called call. So let's just go ahead and do that. This could be null. Go ahead and import that type. And we are going to call set call like this. And then we probably want to do some cleanup, right? So when this effect unmounts, we probably want to leave the call and then client. I think there's like an end method or a stop. Let's see what we have here. We have disconnect user. So leave the call and disconnect the users. So some additional things we're going to need is the user ID. Remember, we're using next auth, right? So we have the session potentially. I can say const use session and we can import that. And then the session should have the user ID on it. So instead of like defining this um, in that, we're going to have to get the user ID from session.data.user.id. Now, if this thing is not defined, we just want to return and not do it. And then here we want to run this logic if session changes. So for user, we can just go ahead and say user ID like this. So now if you're authenticated, you're going to have a unique user ID as you join rooms. And we're going to use that as our identifier when you try to join these different rooms. Okay, so for call, uh, we need to also make sure that this is defined. Now technically we had to add a spinner or a loader here, but let's do one more thing here. The last thing we need to do is this authentication token. Um, so the way authentication works, if you're just doing development locally, you have to generate an auth token and they have a way to kind of do that for you. Let's go to authentication over here. And I believe they have a token generator. So let's click on the token generator. And then you can pass in your user ID here. And your API secret. What is API secret? That comes from our actual here. We have the secret here. We can copy it. And we're going to paste that in here, which I think it is already that. No. So we're going to paste in our secret. And then we want our user ID. What is the user ID for our user? Well, let's go over here. Let's figure that out. Let's go back to users. And let's click on that. And here is my ID. So I'll copy that. And let's go somewhere. Here it is. I'll paste that in. This is your token. Now, technically, this is something that you want to generate when you click join room or when you click create room. And you want to store that in your browser as the page is loading, right? And I think they have an API for doing that. But for right now, we're just going to verify this works by taking this token. And we are going to just use it. So let's just go here. I'll paste in the token here. And um, I think we're forgetting the call set client. So I'm going to go ahead and just call set client here so we can access it over here. And this could be, instead of my first call, I think this needs to be an ID of the call. So in our case, we have the room, right? We need to get the room ID. So I'll just go ahead and pass in like the whole room information. That, and then this could be room dot ID. 
So now that we have this all set up, let's just go ahead and render out the video player that we are setting up. I think we called it Dev Finder Video. Like this. Import that. And this should hopefully, if we go back to our app, we should see it start to ask for some permissions here. Notice that it's actually um, allowing my camera. Now there's a little issue. I think room ID is not defined here, so we need to make sure we pass in room for this effect. And I'm gonna say if there is no room, then also probably just uh, return. Oh, sorry, I need to do that here. If there's no return, there's if there's no room yet, then just return as well. So we want to make sure that the session is defined, and the user is logged in, and there's a room that came back. So I think it was working. I just forgot to add in a couple of things. Um, for example, I brought in a stream theme. It stream automatically has like this nice theme you can use for your video call session. And then I also added some speaker layouts in call controls. And then finally, there is a style that we have to import, which I forgot to do. So let's just go ahead and import the styling directly from stream IO video react SDK. And now we should actually be able to see like a camera a webcam and we can actually change our camera here. I don't know why it's picking my OBS virtual camera. But here we go. Now we can actually see myself. I'm going to switch over to the dark mode so it looks a little bit better. So right now we use their little like web API to generate these tokens for the authentication. We actually want to do this on a server action so that we can get real tokens based on the user ID. So here is an example of how you can do it with their node API. So over here they tell you how to provide a token provider. So when you make a new stream video client, you can pass it a callback function. So where are we making the new stream video client right here? I'll just pass in the token provider, this. And what we can do here is basically call a server action. So let's say generate token. And we don't have a server action defined yet. So let's just make one here. I'll call, call it actions.ts. I'll say use server, export async function, generate token. And for this to work, what we need to do is I believe there's a Node.js SDK we could basically just pull in. We can kind of just call these two lines of code. Uh, let's just grab it all just so we have like a reference. Copy that, I'll paste it in there. And there's a couple things we'll need. We need the API key, which we have already. Um, that's already a next public stream API key. So we could probably just say process env dot that. We need the app secret. So we don't have that yet. So we need to make sure we define that. I'll say get stream secret and probably put key at the end there. And that's on our dashboard. So if we go back to our dashboard here, we can click on this and then paste that in there. Now I'm going to go ahead and just update this one as well. All right. And stream chat, we might have to import something for that to work, but so then let's take this and we'll say, uh, what do we call it again? Get stream secret key, call it that. Now we can just use that. And for user ID, we're going to have to pass that in. Probably get the session, which remember we need that helper function inside that lib auth folder. We get the session and we should be able to get the user ID from that session. Um, if there is no session, we probably want to throw an error. And then we have session dot. Oh, we need to await on it. Don't forget the await. We'll say session dot user dot ID. And It'd be good there. Now we just need to return the token and then also fix this one import that we're missing for stream chat. Where is stream chat defined? I'm not sure. I think we have to import it somewhere. So let's go to back in and they are using stream chat. All right, so I don't think I have that installed. I'm gonna install it here, stream chat. And that should allow us to import this thing. Um, how do they import this? just like this, and import it like that, I believe. Okay, so now we have a server action. I'm gonna add action at the end of that function name. And then we're gonna call it like this. And then we're gonna pass in, um, wait, do we need to pass anything in? I think we're good. I think we can just do this. All right, let's get rid of that hard-coded token and let's make sure this all still works. Um, well, I'm going to delete the token that was hard coded and now I'll just give a token provider. And so when the stream starts initializing, it's going to call our function, which should 
invoke the server action, get some token back, and hopefully set that up. So let's make sure this is still working fine. And go back to face camera. Awesome. And I would like to test this out. I might go grab another laptop so I can test this out um, and have multiple people connected to the same stream. But for right now, let's just commit what we have because we did a lot of changes. I don't want to lose these changes. So I'm going to go over here and I will say adding in the video component from stream. Go ahead and sync that up. All right, so now let's try something pretty cool with this. I have another laptop next to me, and I'm going to go ahead and see if I can connect with that laptop to this same chat room. All right, so I am logged in uh, on another tab with a different email account. So I'm going to try to join the exact same room, and let's see if this works. Go ahead and click Join Room. And now we have two users who are in the same room. I'm just getting access to my camera and stuff like that. All right, so on the other tab that I've opened with my other user, what I can do is I can actually share a completely different window or screen. So in our case, I'm going to share my VS Code editor. And now I can see that pop up over here. So, right? so I have another terminal open. I can just go ahead and like share what I'm working on. You can hear me talking. And this is actually pretty cool. This took very little effort to get screen sharing going. And we have a ton of built-in functionality with the screen sharing, right? I can block people, I can turn off their video, turn off their audio, do full screen and stuff like that. So the one thing that you'll notice is like the video has like a UID down here. I think we could probably make this better and have it display the name of the user. So let's go back to where we set up this video player and the user itself, we can pass in some cool information. So for example, we could pass in the name, which should be on the session. And we can also pass in an image which again should also be on the session. Um, let's try to figure out why some of the stuff might be undefined. I think name is potentially undefined. So we could say unknown. And then for image, yeah, we'll just go ahead and um, do this. If it's not defined, we'll just say unlined like this maybe. You know, it's just a fallback on undefined on both of these. Okay, so now hopefully it says my name down here. Awesome. So let's also verify the image is working. So there's components that stream will give you out of the box. For example, one is called participation list or participants list, which kind of looks like this. And this displays your name and your image and stuff like that. So something that'd be cool if we can actually like get this to display. Let's go down here and let's just go ahead and put it inside a stream call. Put it on the right over here, I guess. And let's import that and see. This will show. Now it does look like it needs an on close method. So I'm gonna say on close. And for right now, I'm gonna see if I can get away with like, just not doing anything. I'll just say undefined. Okay, so now let's go back to our app and there should be a participants list that shows up down here. We can like search over everything. Um, we can do various things with people. I can close it, which I guess we'd have to kind of use our own react state to make this like closable and just like not display it. So far, I really like the stream library. Like this was super easy to get a lot of components out of the box just by importing them and displaying them. And I think if we restructure our app a little bit, we could actually put this and nest it inside of the video component here, which allows us to give us more flexibility of like having this thing um, in the participants list, maybe being down here if you wanted to. I won't dive into the, like that refactoring just yet because there's a couple of things I want to do. The first thing I want to do is if you were to close the video, I want to kick the user back and take them back to the home page. So when they click leave call, let's try to figure out a callback that we can invoke when that happens. So over here, there's an on leave callback function, and this will be pretty easy to get set up. All we need to do, I think, is just say const router is equal to use router, import that from next navigation, and then down here, when you on leave, you can say router.push and go back to the home page because I think it's going to automatically clean up when we leave this component and unmount the client connection and stuff like that. So let's click this and let's go back to the home page. We did get an error. Cannot leave the call that has already been left. So I'm actually going to do here, I'm going to say catch and then we're just going to log the error. We don't want that error to get uncaught and bubble up. And then same thing here. I think this might be a promise. Um, which 
we could probably only call like this. So basically just log any errors that happen and um, yeah, that should hopefully work. Probably want to just return from there too. Uh, let's try this. I'm going to join the room and I'm going to go ahead and just let it connect and then I'm going to leave. And it did log it out, but that's fine. So well, another thing that I think would be good to do is I noticed that when you log out up here, if I have a click sign out, it doesn't kick us back to the home page. It just like logs us out and then this view thing just like crashes because it expects you to have a user ID. But now you just like deleted your session. It doesn't really know how to clean up this view. So let's go to the header and let's add some logic so that when someone clicks on log out or sign out, um, which is here, we want this. You have a callback URL probably. I think you can do this and we can say callback URL and we're going to just say go back to the dashboard so that this doesn't happen. Um, I'll click sign out. That'll sign me out to go back to the dashboard. And another thing I notice is that this avatar and sign in should not be visible at all when you're signed out. So let's figure out where that is being displayed. Count drop down. First of all, we don't need a sign in button here. I don't think that even needs to be there. So we're going to go ahead and just like delete all this stuff. Okay, so for account drop down, we only want this to display if session dot data is defined. We haven't even brought that in. So let's just say const session is do use session like that. And now that'll be gone. That will not show the drop down unless you're already signed in, but we now don't have a sign in button. So let's kind of add that in. I'm going to say if or not signed in, we can just go ahead and bring in a button that looks like this. And we really don't want to do that. Let's just say this. Let's see what happens. Cool. Um, let's try it. Sign in. So a couple of other things I want to try to implement. Um, I kind of talked about this before, but on the search page, if there's a way to filter based on keywords or tags, I think that would be pretty cool. So let's go up here and let's add like a search bar just so that we can filter down a little bit. So I'm going to go to find dev rooms, this, and then we're going to add a form here called search bar. And then we're going to go ahead and make a component. Just do it right here in the app since this is going to be in the same folder, search bar, TSX, export function, search bar. So I do want to use like a form. So remember how you created a form over here? We had to bring in like this form component, and do all this stuff. So I'm going to take that and we're going to reuse a lot of this stuff. Copy all this, honestly. Okay, and then we're going to take all this stuff and do this. And we're going to delete a lot of this stuff. So I'm going to delete Great room action, comment it out, comment that out. We don't need all these, we just need search. Okay, and then we don't need all these form fields, we really just need one. So delete that. I have a button that says search. This will be called search. We'll go up here, we'll call this one search. It can be a min of zero if you want to clear it out. And we'll say search by keywords. Okay. And uh, we don't need a description over here. Let's just see how this looks if we were to use it. So we're not importing it yet, but we do need to bring in the search bar component and import that. Okay. And we should see a search bar pop up. There it is. And I might actually get rid of the label. So let's go back here. Go we'll find the label. We don't need a label. I'll say search or filter rooms by keywords such as TypeScript, XJS, Python, that type of stuff. Okay, so now when a user were to type into this thing and click the search button, we need to do a query. So I'm, I'm going to style this a little bit. I'm going to move the search button to the right. And the way we can do that is on the form itself, you give it flex. I should put them on the same page. 
And then the search bar, I think we just make it a little bit larger. I think this could be like a width of 300 pixels maybe, or maybe like 240 pixels. And I should probably put that on the input itself like this. I have 340. Okay, it's still pretty small, 400. Awesome. And then on the form itself, we're going to just put, um, you know, not on the form. I'm going to do it down here. I'm going to do margin bottom of 12 like this. A little bit of extra touches. We should probably add like a magnifying glass icon inside of search. Let's go over here. Let's find the button. And I'll say search icon. Okay. Um, over here. Last name, margin right of two. Probably add a little bit of space between the input and the search bar. And the way we can do that is just say gap of two here. I think my head might have been hiding. Okay. And there you have it. So the functionality, when you type in something here and click search, we want it to actually probably kick off an action to get the new data or just refresh the page that has like a different search criteria. So in our case, if I were to type TypeScript, press search, I want that to reload this page and redo the query. Okay, so let's go here. And so on click, what we can do is I can say router dot. Oh, I don't have router. Let me import it. Let's say const router is equal to use router. Like this. And then I'm going to say router.push, and we want to go to the same page, but we're going to tack on a search query string like this. I'll just do a, like that. Maybe I'll call it search. And then also, if search is not defined, so like I'm going to say if it is defined, we're going to go ahead and use it. Otherwise, we'll just say router.push, go, go to the same page with no query string. Okay, so now if I type in TypeScript, press submit, notice that it did add a query string here. That's cool because now a user can bookmark this. They can share this with people. And then we have state that's embedded in the URL, which makes it a little bit easier for us as developers because now we don't have to like store this in state and do all that stuff. So how do we get this to actually redo a query when we change the query string? Well, remember on the props here, we have params. Actually, I don't remember what it's called. Let's do props. Let's say console log props. And this could be any. I do think I need to load up my next app so I can see. We have a search params. Notice that this popped up. It says search params search of TypeScript. So we have that information there. And I can just simply do this. I can type this. And then this will be search of string. Make sure I have that right. All right. So now instead of calling get rooms just by itself, we can actually pass in search params dot search. And if this thing were not to be defined, it would just pass in undefined. So now we can actually say search is a string or it could be undefined. We don't know. And instead of saying find many, we need to say where. So we could say where. And then we'll say EQ. And then we're going to say room dot tags. Now instead of EQ, I do think we want to go to drizzle and like figure out, I think we want like. So like is a way we can kind of search over and see if it has a string in it. Um, unless there's something else we could potentially do. I think like is probably fine. I'm going to import like, and then I'm going to use like instead. And we're going to do like this, and then we'll do interpolation here. And then we'll say search. Now search is potentially not defined, right? So if it's not defined, it might make more sense to actually make this be different. So I'm going to say const where is equal to, if search is defined, we'll do that. Otherwise we'll do nothing. Um, and then I think we can just pass that in hopefully doesn't like that. So actually we can say, uh, we'll set this to undefined. I think that'll make it happy. So let's, let's try this. Let's go back to our app. I'm gonna go ahead and just type in uh, JavaScript, click search, TypeScript, click search, clear it out, click search. And, um, yeah, it looks like it 
worked good. And now I think what I'm gonna do is if you are on a page that you're already like searching a criteria, I might just have a button that says clear filters so that you know that you actually have like a filter typed in. It's not too apparent if you were to delete this and you're like, I can't see all my data, right? So let's go back to search, the search bar here. And we're gonna have to pass in, first of all, the parameters, which I think we can actually just get. Actually, I can say use search params, do that. And then over here, we're gonna display a button if search is defined, like this, and save that. And you have to do a git on it. Yeah, this should work. And then if, uh, we, uh, we'll call it clear, which is just going to kind of clear the search form. Yeah, this looks good. So let's try this. Okay, um, let's click clear and see what happens. Yeah, so it deleted that, it cleared out this. I'm gonna say TypeScript, press search, press clear. There you have it. Last thing I do wanna fix, cause there's a bug. If I were to just refresh this page, notice that although the clear button does show up, TypeScript is not here. So we wanna kind of map the query string to the input. So let's go to our input here. And I think the way we can do this is default value. We have the query, so we can say query dot get search. Otherwise we can just call it default it to um, an empty string, right? So now if I were to refresh the page, that'll get set in and I can just clear it. And if I refresh, it still works fine. All right, let's just command what we have now. I'm gonna go ahead and say adding the ability to query by tags. All right, so one more thing that I think will be really beneficial is now that we have the ability to filter based on tags, what if you clicked on one of these badges, we could have it automatically route to this page with the filter in the URL. So let's go to our badge, uh, actually it's called a something list, tags list. And so like when you click on one of these badges, I'll just say on click, we're gonna go ahead and just do a router.push. Need to make sure I bring in const router. Is equal to use router, this. And then router.push is equal to, and we could just go ahead and do the main page like this, and I'll say search is equal to um, lang. Now, I, I, let me rename this from lang to tag. I think that was left over like this. Okay, so now anywhere in our application, which, okay, this needs a client component. So I'll say use client. Okay, at this point, it's complaining that split tags is not a function. It's because I added use client here. I might just make a utils and I'll just call this like, yeah, I'll just, I'll just put it here in utils. I'll paste that in, split tags. Um, and now, anywhere where we did split tags before, we're gonna have to fix. I need to import this from a different location. Like this, and then I think over here, we probably need to not import it from there. Okay, so now we can click on this one. Notice it takes us to TypeScript. So there is a little bug with this. When I click on TypeScript, notice that it does actually filter down for TypeScript things, but it's not putting the TypeScript filter here. Let's try to figure out what's going on there. Um, in the search bar, I mean, we get the query here. So I think if I were to just go ahead and like print this out, maybe it's not um, doing that when you click on, let's say node. It does run. But I, th I think, hold on, let's also do this. I'm gonna say git search. We, we may just have to add an effect. I think it's like getting confused. Yeah. So this is only gonna run once because it's state and like it's gonna be probably behind the scenes is probably like using some state somewhere that's not being unmounted. So we're gonna say use effect. And we wanna listen for when the query search were to change. I think that's how we can potentially do it. And technically we could just say like search is equal to that. Check to see if this thing actually changes. Go ahead and import use effect. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say form.setValue. We're gonna use that search. And we also probably need form. 
Okay, that seems like it's fixing it. Now, is that the proper fix with the use effect? Not too sure, but if it gets the job done, it gets the job done, right? Now, the cool thing about this is that since we're using a reusable component, if you were to click on, for example, TypeScript here, that'll take you back. That'll disconnect you from the room, and then you can see all of the dev rooms that are running with TypeScript keywords. Now, I would like it if this was a cursor and not a, like a select. So let's go back to tabs, tags list. And on the badge itself, I'm gonna say cursor is a pointer. And because this is clickable, it might be better to like make this a button instead of a badge, or you can probably add a, um, I think you're gonna add a tab index of zero so that now you can actually like tab on it. And you could also probably add an area roll of button. Okay, just make it a little bit more accessible so I can actually go and like click on different stuff. Actually, I can't even press enter, right? I should be able to press enter. So I think what I might do is this thing have an as child. It doesn't seem to have an, uh, an as child. So actually, I wonder if I can just like make a button and wrap this whole thing like that. Click on the button here. There's different ways you can hack at HTML and CSS and whatever make this work. Now we have these. If I were to enter on them, it works. Do I really like this? I think a better approach would be look at the badge itself and just grab this. Like grab the whole class names here. And honestly, like, don't even use the badge component anymore. Because I don't think it's the most accessible approach. I don't think we're even using a variant. Okay, so now notice before is like the outline wasn't directly on the button, but now it looks like a button and it acts like a button. Okay, the other wrapping a button with the badge was kind of a hack. So this is something cool to point out though, is that everything in ShadCN, typically it exports the variants. So you can apply the same styles to whatever DOM element you want just by doing something like this which I think is really nice because now it's like, I want it to look like a badge, but I don't want to use the badge component. All the same styles are accessible to us. We just bring them in. Cool. So now if I go and join the room and go to this, I can kind of go back and awesome. Let's go ahead and commit that as well. So I'm going to say better, uh, I'll say clickable badges and I'll submit that. So let's continue adding some more features. I think one thing that would be pretty nice is the ability to keep track of the rooms that you have created. And we could have like a separate route for that potentially and just show all the rooms that you created. Let's go back to our Next.js application and I will make a your rooms endpoint. And it's gonna be kind of similar to like our main page here where we kind of like query, get all the rooms and then we display those. So let's see if we can kind of use that approach. So open up this page over here and we can just go ahead and copy all of this code. And we are going to go to, let's go to your rooms. Let's say page.tsx and we'll paste that in. And let's just kind of refactor some code here. I'll say your rooms page. And at this point, we probably want to reuse the room card, okay? So now we've reached a point where we have like a shared component. And I think it makes sense to go over here and just make it here. So room card .tsx. Go ahead and copy all of this code and I'll paste it in there. Delete anything that's not used. And then export it. And now let's go over here and we don't need to define room card in this file. And we also don't need to define it in this file because I think they're going to have the exact same style to them, right? So let's auto import room card from that components directory. Let's also auto import it from the other file and just do a little bit of cleanup here. This would have to go up a level, I believe. Some of the stuff would go away. Okay, let's go over here, make sure this is cleaned up. And then we'll also go over here, clean up this.
Awesome. So here where it says find dev rooms, I'm going to say your rooms. We could keep the create room button. Um, we don't really need a search bar anymore, I don't think. I mean, like how many rooms is a user going to have? Hopefully not that many. Um, but we're going to change this fetch method. And instead of saying get rooms, I'm going to say get your rooms. Or maybe it'd make more sense to say get my rooms since like we're authenticated. Um, maybe I'll just say get user rooms. How about that? That, may, that might make a little bit more sense. And so we could make this method. We go over here to data access, go back to rooms. I'm going to go ahead and copy this whole function here. And then I'm going to use get rooms, get user rooms here. All right. And we don't need the ability to search so we can get rid of that. But what we do need is we need to get the session. So again, how do you check if you are logged in? I can say const session is equal to get session. And make sure you import it from the right directory. I'm going to wait on it. And then if the session is not defined, obviously we should throw an error. Or sometimes what you could do is just return an empty array. It kind of depends on your use cases. Um, yeah, so now let us do a where clause. So I want to make sure that I only get the rooms. So I could bring in EQ, which is that already there? Yeah, we already have EQ from Drizzle. And we want to get room dot user ID. And then make sure that matches the currently logged in session dot user dot ID. And we don't need search here, keep it simple. So now we got a method that is authenticated. Only a logged in user can hit this endpoint. And we can use it right here. So let's just go ahead and auto import it. That should give us back all the rooms that I own, that I have created. And also we don't need search parameters. So technically we can delete that. Delete that method. And now we need a way to let the user be able to get to that link. So I might just put it in the header. Let's go to the header here. And let's find um, a place to put a link. So right now we have space between. So if we put another div here, we could typically have uh, the links here. Or if you want to do like nav, um, if you want to do semantic HTML, we can make a link and we can have that go to, um, what do I call it? Your rooms. And then you could say your rooms. That. And let's see if it shows up. So now we have a your rooms link. Unfortunately, there's not really good styling, so we should probably style it with some class. Class name equal to hover underline. Simple, easy enough. One thing I will say is that, like, you'll notice that we have all these different, like, custom hover styles. You may want to abstract away a link component and wrap the next link if you have the same style you're using out through your application. I'm not going to do that just yet, but I want to verify if I click on your rooms, it should take us to a view that just shows the rooms that I have created. Same thing, I should be able to click on create room. That'll go to the form where I can create a room. Awesome. Now this wouldn't be a good tutorial unless I did all the CRUD methods, right? So we should probably have a way to delete the room if a user creates it. So maybe a trash can or like, I don't know, some type of a delete button. Close room maybe. So let's go to the room card. And we have to kind of modify this just a little bit. This is the issue with having shared code is that I want to add additional things to this card that doesn't need to display on this card. And so when you try to make a generic component, what you end up doing is you just like tack on a bunch of extra like if statements and stuff like that to know if you should hide or show the delete button. Um, so now I'm kind of second guessing if this is what we want. I'm just going to go ahead and move it back. I don't, I don't like the idea of having like this. Anyway, let's just go ahead and copy this whole card. Now at least we have a component that we can just like um, just do this user room card and then the difference is we want to add a button here that probably deletes so I'll say like delete room or yeah I'll say delete room and then we'll give it an on click and we need it to do something when the user clicks this button so let's verify I think I need to refactor a little bit of imports going on here so this needs to be dot slash uh, user room card and I'm going to rename this to user room card over here and that could be called user room card and this could be used over there and then on the page itself we need to go back and change this to just import directly from room card 
I'm curious, leave a comment what your approach would be. Some people like making components that have like a bunch of different if statements and branch logic in it. Um, I have found that that causes code to be a lot less maintainable versus just copy and paste the entire thing. So every page can be managed in isolation. It just makes your blast radius smaller when you make, make a change and it ends up breaking in every place. But it does add some extra work in like if you need to change the style of the card, yeah, you got to do it in two places now. And that is the trade-off. All right, let's go back to my rooms. And I want to make sure that the delete button shows up, which for some reason it's not. So let's verify. Am I importing user room card? I am. That goes over here. We have a delete room button that should have shown up. Um, I think it's because I'm doing as child. Let's get rid of as child. Breaking because I forgot to add use client at the top. Also add that to your room card. That. All right. So that should make Next.js happy. Now we have a delete room. So something I haven't shown you yet. At least I don't remember showing you. I, I might have. Is a variant. We could just go ahead and add in like a danger or a destructive to that. So now it's red. It says delete room. Um, obviously, I like to add like a trash icon to it. All right. And then make it a little bit smaller. I could say width of four, height of four, and um, margin right of two. Why not? Cool. And then also put a little bit of gap between these two. So let's just go ahead and add some gap here, which I'll say class name. I'll say flex gap of two. How about that? Now, many applications will have confirmation. Right now, if I just click this, we don't want it to just delete the room. We want to show a modal and give the user one additional confirmation that, hey, are you sure you want to delete this room? You've probably seen that in many applications. The cool thing is that's very easy to do. We could just load up a dialogue here. So let's go to ShadCN. We have a dialogue, kind of looks like this. There's also an alert dialogue, which I think is actually more what we want, okay? Are you absolutely sure? Cancel, continue. And that's what we're going to pull in. So let's just go ahead and grab this alert dialog and we're going to install it. We've done that 50 times already. We know how to do it. And then we're going to import this whole dialog and just put it directly in the user room card. Okay, just paste that stuff in and let's grab this whole alert dialog. And we can go ahead and just put it right here. Now, there are some issues I run into, like um, typically your alert dialog has a trigger and the trigger, I think we could put this whole button here. Let's just go ahead and paste the button here and let's see if this works. So now if I were to go back to our application and click delete room, see how fast that was? Got a nice alert dialog popping up, super easy to do. Um, and now what we want to do is say continue or cancel. We probably want to rename this a little bit. We could probably say yes, delete. All right, let's save that. So it says yes, delete. And then when we click it, oh, we should probably rena rename this. So this action cannot be undone. This will permanently remove the room and any data associated with it. There we go. And so instead of putting the on click here, I was thinking about like deleting it on this button click. But now what we want is we need to do it on the action here. So I think we could just simply say on click and we can do the logic on the action itself. But I do want to double check. Are we on the right path? Are we doing this correctly? Let's go see how they do it. Um, you can also go up here and click API reference and that'll take you to Radix because what this allows you to do is see if there is something that we can listen to when the user confirms. Um, on open change, okay, button submit. Um, yeah, I think we're doing the, the right way. So yeah, I'll just simply go here and we need to delete the room. Now, how do we delete the room? Well, we're gonna have to call a server action, which again, let's just go ahead and make an actions.ts here. And then we're gonna say use server. And they'll say export async function delete room action. Okay. Now we're going to have to call a data access method. So let's go down here and we're going to make one called a export async function delete room. And then we need to somehow use drizzle to delete a room. 
So it looks like you can say query dot room dot. Um, actually, you can't. Let's say delete. Okay, and then let's do the name of the table. So that'll be room. Can I do where? Is that the syntax we need to do. Let's also pass in room ID. So let's say room ID, and this will be a string. So hopefully this will delete the room. And um, now that I think about it, I I don't like how the data access layer has knowledge of Next.js. Like this should be that layer of abstraction that I told you about. But unstable no store is a next thing. So what I actually might do, um, I'm getting distracted right now, but I think this is super important now that I thought about it, is anywhere we're calling get rooms, we really should just basically call no store inside the React component itself instead of our helper function. I think that'll make the code uh, better. So we can also do it here. They get user rooms. Find out where we're calling that. Go ahead and say no store. Are we calling it somewhere else? Nope. Uh, get room. Do it over there. Import that. Move that to the top. Cool. And then finally, that we should be good. Okay, so the delete room action. This needs to call. I'm just going to say await delete room. And we need to pass out a room ID, which we don't have. And we also need to authenticate. So we need to make sure that we have the session like this. Get the session from that library. There is no session. We're not authenticated. And then we could simply make sure that the room ID is passed in here. OK. And now we also want to make sure, does the user have access to this room? So did the user create this room? So let's just go ahead and say const room is equal to await get room. Pass it the room ID. And then I'm going to say if room dot user ID is not equal to that session ID, we're going to throw an error. And then finally, we can call delete room, uh, which we need to import. So let's import it from the data action. And now we have authentication and authorization. So like make sure that the user who is trying to delete this room actually exists on that entry in the database. So we can go back to the room card here. And what we need to do is call it. So I'm going to say delete room action like this. Probably pass it the room ID. OK. Now there is one more thing we have to do here. When you delete the room, you need to make sure that the page you're on refreshes. So we can say revalidate path. And we're just going to revalidate your rooms like this. Just so that, I mean, this action should only ever be called from the your rooms route. So we want to make sure you revalidate that. Let's try it out. So these are the rooms that I own. If I were to click it, we get a modal. You click yes, and now it's gone. And if I were to try to do that behind the scenes with another user who doesn't have access to that room, it would throw an exception or an error for that user as well. So let's just delete these things. Pretty cool. So we have a way to delete. And now we can actually join the room, and we can potentially edit um, the room. And there's so much stuff we can add to this. I mean, this is just getting more and more fun to work on. So I think another thing we need is middleware. And also, probably hide this if you're not logged in. So you shouldn't be able to go to this route unless you are authenticated. Because if you're not authenticated, well, like, what should you show here? So I could kind of demo that if I were to sign out and then go to that page. Notice that it just crashes because you're not authenticated. You shouldn't be seeing this room at all to begin with. So one approach you can do is use a middleware. OK, so inside a source, we're going to say middleware.ts. And we're going to go to the next off docs, because I don't remember how to do any of this stuff off the top of my head. So let's go to search middleware. Let's go over there. And it looks like you could just basically do this. So if I go ahead and say this, copy this, paste it in, you can specify in this matcher what routes you want to basically verify that you have to be logged into view. So in our case, we could say your rooms, save it. And if I did this correctly, sometimes you have to restart Next.js. Um, let's just go to slash your rooms, click it, and there. we get redirected to the login page because you just hit a route that you should not be able to access unless you're authenticated. And again, if you don't understand the reason for behind a middleware, 
it runs before the actual route logic starts to run. Okay, so if you deploy this on Vercel or some type of deployment that has Edge, it's going to be very quick to check to see if the user is logged in. And then if not, they're just going to get redirected to that login page. So it's just a nicer user experience versus sometimes you might have seen in applications, you'll go to a page, that page starts loading or has a spinner, and then you get kicked out of that page back to another page. And it's kind of a kind of jarring and abrupt. So middlewares can help reduce that issue. Um, second thing, we have this your rooms in the header up here. Let's go to the header. I'll say your rooms. This should not show up um, unless you're logged in, right? So let's go over here. I'm going to abstract this away. Instead of session.data, I'm going to say const is logged in equals to this. And I'll double negate it. We're going to kind of use that because I think that's easier to kind of read. And then also if we're logged in, um, we could just play that. This. Um, another thing we should kind of do is we probably want the user to be logged in um, to even be able to view a chat room. Personally, I don't know. That, that's kind of up to your discretion. If you were to build this application, like how would you do it? To me, I think it's good to get people to log into your app um, just because once they're logged in, you can easily delete their account or ban them if they're doing something malicious versus if you just let guest people do stuff, you got to worry about a lot more like malicious activity. Um... So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to say browse and that could just go to dashboard and we're also going to update the middleware and I'm going to do a little bit more refactoring where at some point we're going to need a landing page. If you were to turn this into a real product, you want a landing page that people can view. You have like a video, you have some testimonials, you have screenshots and stuff like that. So having the root of the app display this, probably not what you're going to want when you go to production. So what we could do is I could make a new folder called browse and then we'll have this link go to the browse link and then we're going to move the room card in there, search bar and the page. Let's do that. The header could stay where it is right here. And hopefully now the homepage has nothing. So we definitely need to go back and add page.tsx there. And we'll say export default function homepage, or I actually like calling it the landing page. Um, it's like a better marketing term for it, I think. Okay, so now we should have a landing page show up. And we probably want to have like something that says like get started and stuff like that. But if you're logged in, we can go to a browse page, which we need to go and update the middleware as well and make that authenticated. Let's go to the middleware. Just go ahead and say slash browse. Super simple. And now you have to be logged into that page too. And yeah, I think that's good. So do you want to work on the landing page? I guess we could work on the landing page. I'll show you how I typically do that. Since we are using Tailwind, I would recommend finding a collection of Tailwind components. So there's tailwindcomponents.com, which is like, a, I think a community collection of components. They're, they're pretty subpar, I'm not going to lie. So Tailwind UI, you can buy a subscription and you can start using some really nice components for your entire application. So like if you're going to go to templates, I'm sorry, yeah, go to components, go to documentation. And, uh, you know, how do I get, how do I get the components? House components. Oh, I just had to scroll down. Okay. So going down here, um, obviously there's all these different sections. Some of them are paid. Some of them you have to upgrade to get access to, but they have a landing page. Um, so like the hero section is typically what you consider the landing page and they give you this free to use one, right? Everything else is going to cost money. Um, but if you're not really keen on design and spending a lot of time, like trying to I don't know, make your UIs look nice, I would just grab some existing markdown from this app. So I'm going to grab all this and we will kind of gut all the things we don't want. So let's paste that all in. Okay. Maybe I should have clicked this copy button that probably wouldn't have been a better approach okay um and there's some things that we need to get rid of right so we don't care about navigation here because we made our own header don't care about that or that let's go ahead and just scroll down this whole dialogue can go away save it a little bit and let's see how this looks after we clean up all of the messy things 
All right, so let's go back to Dev Finder, and here we have it. We have a nice landing page. And again, you can keep on grabbing sections from not just Tailwind UI, but like you can find other Tailwind things. I think uh, Flowbyte is another one I've seen. And then we can kind of get rid of like all this other stuff, like announcing. You don't have a seed, rounds, funds, or anything, so delete that. Data to enrich your online business. I'll just go ahead and say, find other awesome devs to pair with online. And then for the description, I'll say, this platform is for sharing your screen and working with other random developers online so that you can work together. I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not good at this marketing stuff. But there you go. Get started. Learn more. We don't need a learn more page. Let's just delete that. Get started. We definitely want to add a next link over here like this. And we should probably just, we could just hack this to take them to the browse page because again, we have the middleware set up. So now if we click this, it'll ask us to log in. There's like a Tailwind thing up here. We should probably get rid of that Tailwind image coming from that. Um, this whole nav bar, just, let's just get rid of it. We don't need the header because we did our own, remember? And I'll call this a landing page again. That got kind of lost in translation. Some additional things is like, why, why can we scroll right now? It feels kind of weird that we're scrolling. And then also the dark mode support is kind of weird. Like, why is this whole page white? Um, it's hard-coded the BG white. Probably shouldn't hard-code that. And then also the header itself. If you look at the header, it's like underneath these little decorative things. But we can go to our header. And we're going to go ahead and find the navigation right here. I'll say Z of 10. That should hopefully pull it up above which it did not. So we also need to say relative. There you go. So now it's above. And then for the text here, we need to kind of add some dark mode support. So let's go back to our landing page. And they have some hard coded text gray stuff here. So in dark mode, I'll say text of white. There you go. Um, dark mode, I'll say text gray of 200. And get started looks fine. Yeah, let's just try this. I'm gonna switch it back to light mode, make sure it still looks okay. Back to dark mode. There you go. And then we could probably put like a an icon right here, right? Take our dev finder icon and just put it right here above that text. So let's find that location. Looks like it's right here. We can say image. And then we'll go ahead and say source is equal to slash logo PNG. And then width 100. Height is 100, alt is dev finder logo. And I don't think it's called logo. Let's, what do we call it? We call that icon. Let's change the icon. There it is. Probably make it a little bit bigger. And then for last name on the icon or the image, we could say block or sorry, inline block. That should be able to allow us to center it. And there's like a bunch of space here, some padding or margin. I don't know. We need to get rid of that. Just give it a 12 instead of a whatever that is. There you go. Awesome. So let's click get started. I think this should be good enough. You can log in, sign in with Google. And we're back to being authenticated. The header could use a little bit of space in between this. So let's go back to the header here. And we're going to find out those links. So obviously we should, on the nav itself, we should say flex gap of four, maybe space those links out a little bit. There you go. And you can kind of go between those. Awesome. So some more functionality I think we need is the ability to edit some of the stuff. Because right now, once you join the room, like it's just, it's stuck there. You can't edit it. So how you could do this is add an edit button or add like an edit icon up here. We could try doing that. And we also need like an edit page. So let's go to your user room card here. And let's try to find out where working on dev finder. There's like a title somewhere here. Here it is. Inside the header itself, I mean, I'm just gonna go ahead and put a button like this. It's gonna have an icon of Pencil icon? Is that what it is? Pencil icon. Here we go. 
And sometimes just having an icon is good enough. People can know that it's like something you can edit. But on here, I think there's a way to say like variant or size. I think we can say like it's an icon type. Okay, there you go. And then I'm going to give this some absolute positioning. So I'm going to go ahead and just say button last name is absolute. I'll say top is one, right is one, and then here on the card header, just give this a relative. Okay, this is kind of how you can like make stuff be floated on the top right of a card. Um, maybe even give it more than that. I'll give it a top right of two to this. Just to move it in to the bottom left a little bit. Um, yeah, so now if we click on this thing, we should be able to go to an edit page. So again, how do you make it a link? Well, you can say link here, and then we'll go like this. And so then we'll add an href to this, and we'll say like rooms. Um, you know, I'll just call it edit room. Simple enough. And then we'll just interpolate the room ID. Like this. What am I missing? I'm missing curly braces, I think. Okay, so if I click on this, it should take us to edit room, which isn't defined. And so now we need to add it. So let's go to, uh, where do we create the room? Let's just copy and paste this whole thing. And I'm gonna call it edit room. Also, the middleware. We wanna make sure that the edit room is defined as a authenticated endpoint or sorry uh, oh i was hiding my, my head behind that slash edit room okay now if you click this hopefully it'll show something it didn't show anything for some reason oh my bad i need to do the room id room id can't forget that let's just move those components into that directory there and now should work i hope there we go so again, this goes back to the whole, like, we already have a create room that has a form that has, like, the exact same stuff. Why not just reuse it? And again, my warning to you is I have done that in the past. You think you can just, like, reuse the same page, but then a business requirement comes in and changes, like, one little thing in your edit room form, and then you have to go and, like, just hack together all these components to, like, allow it to show certain things and hide different things. So copying and pasting um, is my friend. So... Let's rename some of the stuff. Instead of create room, we'll call it edit room. And then we'll call this edit room form. We'll go here and we'll kind of rename some of this. Edit room form on submit. This needs to call probably an edit room action, which we haven't created yet. And then inside of actions, we'll call it edit room action. And now that I look at this file, I notice that we have like the old approach of just directly integrating with Drizzle. Um, again, we should probably make a, a wrapper here. So I'm going to go to rooms and I'll say like export async function create room. And this thing needs to do something. So like it would have to take in a room data, which would be what? This. And then it also needs to take in a user ID be a string and we don't want it to know anything about the session so let's just go ahead and import some of the stuff so let's go back to the create room form and make sure that when it calls the create room action that we actually call await create room we pass it the room data and then we also pass it the session id I delete that one too. All right, so same thing with over here. Uh, instead of edit room action, we're going to say await edit room. And that probably needs to also do something similar where it takes in the new room data and it probably takes in the session of the user ID. Um, but we don't want it to omit the ID because we know what the, the room ID is, right? In fact, we could just pass in the whole thing, just pass in the whole room. I think that should be fine. And instead of saying edit room here, we're going to call a new method that we're going to copy and paste from this one. The edit room. This needs to take in a whole room object. And the difference is that this needs to do a DB. Uh, is there like an update? 
Yeah, we'll say update room, and then we'll say dot set. I think we could just go ahead and just pass in the whole room data, room data, and then we can say where, and then EQ room dot ID is equal to room data dot ID. Yeah, we don't need user ID any in here anymore. Okay, so now we can call edit room like this. We don't need to pass in the session, but what we do need to do is verify that the person trying to edit this room has access to it. That sounds pretty familiar, right? We already have a delete room action. So if you go to the, um, which one do we want? Probably the your rooms. We can go ahead and just do this. I'm gonna copy all that, paste it in. This will be room data. ID. Go ahead and fetch back the room from the database. We verify that the user trying to modify that room has access to modify it. Then we update the database with that information. And then we probably need to revalidate. Um, you know what? The only way you can edit this is if you go to the edit page. I think we need to say redirect like this, and I think we can just go back to slash your rooms. And then maybe, do we need to revalidate the path too? This I don't know. Do we need to revalidate path? We probably do. Someone will probably leave a comment and tell me that I don't need to do that, so feel free to do that. Okay, so all of that I need to just go ahead and update some of this stuff. So this is complaining because it doesn't have the room ID. And technically we, we know what the room ID is, right? Because this is in the path parameters. But we could say const um it use params. I mean we've done this somewhere else, right? So we can say like params is equal to use params. And then we could say params dot room ID. And we could just go ahead and spread ID of room ID here. And that could just also attach to the values. That'll make that happy, I think. So this definitely needs to be a string though. Um, I'll say as string. You probably wanna make sure that um, the user typed in the string correctly. It's also missing the user ID. So I, th I think let's go back and change this a little bit. I think we do wanna omit. We want to omit the user ID. And I think that should be okay. And then what we could do is when we get back to the room, um, honestly, we could just probably spread the entire room here, spread it with the room data. So basically combine these two objects. This one will have like the new information on it. Actually, that won't be too secure. I'm gonna spread the room data first and then I'll say user ID is equal to room.user ID because we don't want someone to like try to overwrite the user ID. Um, otherwise, that would be pretty bad. Remember, this is just TypeScript. This isn't actually like validated with Zod or anything. Someone could actually change the user ID and send that in the, the payload request. And so we want to make sure that when we edit the room, we pass in all the data that the user sent over, but then we hard code the user ID so it never tries to update the user ID to something else. And there's other ways you could do this. Like you could say, um, if you wanted to be more like specific about that, you could just do room dot description is equal to room data dot description here, and you can kind of by hand update things. This is just like the same approach to say like just overwrite everything, but make sure that the user ID never changes. Um, and you could probably do more things with like Zod validation, so that like you verify tags is a proper like string that has comma separated list values in it. Uh, but let's not worry about that just yet. So let's go back to edit room. Make sure this thing all looks like it's good. So I think the only thing that really changes here is that when this whole thing runs, it needs the initial room data. Okay, so we should probably say room and make this whole component require the room data. And so inside the page, we know how to do that. We can say const room is equal to await to get room. And then we can just go ahead and say like, 
Uh, I forgot how to do that. Is it just like params? We can say params.room ID. And then we'll just say params is equal to that. Looks good. Add an async here. And then we'll pass in room is equal to room. Now it's also saying that could potentially be undefined. So I think if this is undefined, we could say if there is no room, then we're going to just say return room not found. And why is this complaining? It's saying that property room does not exist on that. I think I must have messed up my props. I did. This needs to be looking like this. Okay. And now that we have the room and we know it's going to be defined, we can simply say room.name, say room.description, room.github repo, and also room.tags. Okay, so we're basically just setting up the form with a bunch of default values. This could potentially be null, so I think we need to fall back on empty string here. And let's try it out. So if I were to go to this room and just refresh, notice that all the data is already added in. Pretty cool. And so if I wanted to change this and say, like, you know, let's put some exclamation marks there, click submit, that. I don't know what that just did. It just definitely redirected us back to the home page. Oh, because I left this in here. Um, we don't want to redirect in the client action there. But let's see if it did update the room. So if I go to browse, it did add the exclamation marks. And this is too close. Like, I think I need to add more space there. I'm going to go ahead and say gap of eight. There. I almost misclicked. So I wanted to add a little bit more white space. Let's try it again. So if I go to your rooms, let's edit this. And notice that it didn't actually load the correct data because I think next is going to cache data, right? If I did a hard refresh, I bet you it would work. So I think there's something that we need to kind of further do in the action. Let's go here. We need to revalidate your rooms, but we also need to revalidate path of the entire uh, edit room link. So like, let's do this. And let's pass all this in. I'm not a fan of how you have to do this in XJS. I'll be completely honest with you. I'm just not a fan of it. There are probably ways that we can... Um, oh yeah, we probably need to say no store here. Make sure you don't forget that. Probably also in create room too. Like honestly, I just, I like adding no store to everything. So let's try that again. I'm gonna go ahead and just edit it. Click submit. There we go. It, it updated. Go back to the edit. It did update. I wanna make sure this is all working. That's working pretty good. Let's just go ahead and commit because we made quite a lot of changes. I mean, we removed stuff the round. We added middlewares. We added the ability to edit. I don't even know what else we added. Oh, we added your rooms. We've done quite a lot. So I'm gonna say your rooms page, middleware, um, editing a room. I'm sure there's something else, but let's just go ahead and sync this up. All right, so I think there was another place. Let me just double check something real quick. I think, obviously we can clean up any imports that are grayed out. Go over here and do the same thing. Okay, that looks good. Great room action. I want to make sure this is being cleaned up and doesn't invoke. So something I like adding to my applications is when you create something, I like to show a toast. I think toast just give that user that extra feedback and we're going to try to add that in. So over here, there's a toast component with Shad CN. And this is what it looks like. You click it. And you'll see a toast pop up. I know my screen is hiding it right now, but we'll, we'll show it in a second. So let's just go ahead and grab this toast component. And we're going to import that. All right, let's go. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the toast. And we're going to go to the layout. And let's import the toaster. And we just need to use it like this. So we just say toast, use toast. And then somewhere, um, for example, like when you create the room form, what we want to do is instead of navigating away, we want to show a toast. So let's just go ahead and say, import that here. 
go ahead and auto import use toast. And what we could do is we can go ahead and show it. So I think we can say toast and there might be a way to say, what's the message? Actually, let's go look at what they tell us to do. So just do this. All right, and this will be room created. Your room was successfully created. And now that I think about it, after you create your room, wouldn't it make sense to just join it? Yeah, so I think like we should probably just do some, a redirect that goes straight to the room. Uh, room. Which means we're gonna have to get the room ID back. So like, let's get the created room back. We'll say room.id. And I think I'll need to go here and like return the newly created room, which I'm not sure how to do that in Drizzle. I don't think we'll get the room back here. Room is declared but is never read. Let's look at this. When you insert, I think we can just go ahead and like return the rooms that were created and edited. And hover over this, what do we get? Roomless never. Yeah, I'm gonna go to Drizzle and we're gonna figure out how to get the created room. So after inserting, how do I get the thing that I just inserted? Um, it looks like you can say returning. Let's try that. I'm going to say returning. Oh, sorry. I need to do that inside of the actual like method. So here I'll say returning. And then over here I'll say returning. And I think what that'll do is now we'll have the whole room. You can insert a row and get back its Postgres SQL and SQLite such as this. You can't do that in MySQL. Yeah, I mean, this should have given us... Why is this not working? Hold on. Great room. All returning. If I do this, what is inserted? Inserted is an array. I might just do that. Just return the first thing that was inserted. <laughs> and then what does this give us? Same thing. So I'll just return updated. There's probably a quicker way to kind of do that. Um, like, do they have like a first or something? I don't know. So now go back to the action. This should be defined. It is. And so we can say return the room and we could redirect in the action itself. But again, we want to like have a toast pop up before we just like redirect the user. So I'm going to go ahead and just like not redirect in the action. I'm going to do it in the front end. And now I think this should work. So let's, let's try this out. Go to our app. Let's go to create room. I don't even know why I wasn't signed in. All right, so click create room. Let's just go ahead and type in a bunch of random stuff. Click submit. And we should A, see a toast pop up, which we do at the very bottom. Okay, down there, here's the toast. And then that'll go away. And then we are in the room right here. But we can just go ahead and leave that room if you want to. Same thing with editing a room. I think editing a room, we should get some type of user feedback going. So edit room action. I think I can just go ahead and add that here. Now, I think we do redirect inside the edit room action. So we'll see if this is going to cause issues or not. It might be fine. Um, let's just go ahead and edit this room. I'll click on the edit. And I'll say this is a test. Go ahead and submit it. And it did. It says room was created. Although we, we don't want it to say room was created. I'll say room updated. Your room was successfully updated. So pretty easy to do. Um, now, one thing I'll, I notice is the header. As you zoom out, like the coloring here is like not going full screen. So we should probably fix that. Go ahead and go to the header. And let's try to figure that out. So this whole header component here, we have container on it. I don't think we want the container on this. We need the container on probably this one. Go ahead and add it there and see if that fixes our issue. There we go. Looks like that's full screened. But unfortunately, that doesn't look too correct either. Oh, I think the issue is like, notice the whole page is not contained either. So we should probably zoom out and then we're going to find the layout and inside of the children, we definitely want this whole thing to be in containers and we should do that. 
go ahead and paste that in. There, now that's contained. So if you zoom out and you're on a 4K monitor, like everything will be centered, which is probably a little bit better. All right, let's just keep adding features. So another thing that's very important to have in your applications is the ability for users to delete their accounts. Um, usually GDPR laws require that a user can delete their accounts and all the data associated with their accounts. So let's try to add that to the header. Let's go and find, um, where do I do that? So like somewhere we have like an avatar, account drop down, here it is. And then we can just go ahead and right next to sign out, we're gonna add a menu separator, drop down menu separator. Let's add a separator and then we're gonna add a delete button. So delete account like this and Let's see how this looks like. Add a delete icon here. All right, delete account. Maybe there's a better icon for that, but that's what we're going to use. I don't see a separator though. Is the separator not showing up? Go back and see, drop down, find separator. Yeah, I'm not seeing the separator, but I don't know. It's probably fine. So same thing with deleting an account. We shouldn't just go ahead and delete the whole account when they click this button. We probably want to show a dialog. So let's find that alert dialog, which we did in another component over here. And we could basically take this whole thing and we could just paste it, I believe, right here for delete icon. Now I've had issues with like nesting certain items in other places. Um, but we'll see if this actually allows us to do this. I'm going to try to put this whole thing here. And I'll put that there. And then obviously import some of this stuff. All right, let us see if this works. I'm going to click on my thing, click delete account. And it closes out. Yeah, so this is a, an issue I have seen where like I'm nesting an alert inside of like a drop down here. And then the dropdown gets auto closed, which means that this thing gets deleted. So instead, let me copy this whole thing out. Go back to what it was. And we'll keep delete account there. Um, but what we want to do is I'm going to put it on the outside of that entire dropdown menu so that if it closes, it doesn't like hide the alert. I need to re-import all that stuff because I deleted it on accident. And the way the, and so the alert dialog, it has a, um, an open, right? So we can just go ahead and like say open and open change. We can just go ahead and say const open. And we're going to just kind of pass through these things. So it gives us more control. We have fine control over like this this thing if we wanted to. And what we could do is when you click this, we're just gonna go ahead and um, open the dialog. So I think down here on the item itself, we'll say on click set open true. Okay. Menu item must be used within menu. All right, I'm getting a weird error. Um, I don't know what I messed up, but one debugging technique I would give you is when you start getting weird errors, comment out everything that you think might be causing the error. So it's obviously related to something here, this alert dialog stuff. Uh, I believe because I have drop down menu item here. So instead, change it to a, uh, we don't even need the trigger. That's what we don't need. Let's delete the whole trigger and we'll just use the alert as is. And let's try this. So now if I click delete account, this pops up. Are you absolutely sure this action cannot be undone? This will permanently remove the room and any data associated with it. Let's change the copy a little bit. This will say this will permanently remove your account in any data you uh, have. How about that? And so if you click yes, delete my account, that's when we need to just blow away everything. So I'm going to go ahead and just make an action called delete account action like this. Um, one thing I'll show you that you can actually just have server actions defined like 
literally right here. Like you could have a function that gets invoked. I think you could just say use server in it if you wanted to. Instead of having an actions directory or a file, you can kind of do it this way. Um, I like just having a separate actions file because I think it makes things a little bit easier. So I'm going to say actions.ts. The only downfall is you have now a thousand files that say actions ts everywhere, so that's kind of a pain. Um, but we'll say use server, and then I'll say export async function delete count. And we'll have to do something. So first of all, let's go ahead and bring in that delete account action. Go ahead and add that suffix there. And then we're going to invoke it from the front end. When they click on that yes delete my account, and then when it's done, we're going to close the alert. All right, I'm kind of just assuming it's going to work perfectly fine. So how do you delete a user's account? Um, really, you just have to get their session. So how do we get the session in other places? We just did this. Let's just go ahead and get their session like that. Go ahead and grab that. If we're not logged in, you must be logged in to delete your account. And then finally, we could just go ahead and say like, Add a method here inside a data access called users.ts. Now I'm going to say export async function delete user. And then we're going to have a user ID here, be a string, and then we need to bring in. Uh, what do we need to bring in? Let's just go ahead and bring in everything. How about that? And then DB, you could say delete. And then we're going to say user, which I don't think we have. Oh, here it is, users. And then we'll say where. Go ahead and let AI kind of do that for us. What fields do we have on that? Go to the schema real quick and let's look. So on users, that should be the top level thing. And we have an ID, okay. So yeah, this should work. We should be able to delete that. Why is this complaining though? Type string is not a parameter of SQL wrapper. Delete users where EQ equals, oh, okay, it's, it's gonna be users.id. So again, we have, um, if you go back to the schema, we have, on delete cascade on everything. So if you delete the user, that should also delete their account, their sessions, their tokens, and it should also delete their rooms, hopefully. And we also have this testing thing. We don't need that anymore. I can get rid of that. All right, so let's call this. So I'm gonna say await delete user, and then we'll pass it the session.user ID. Actually, I guess it's called session user.id here. And then finally, we probably wanna redirect the user back to the home page because we should log them out as well. Now, how do we log them out? I don't know how we can log them out. Now, I don't think we can call sign out from a server action. So this, maybe I won't redirect here. I'll just do this logic. And if everything works fine, we'll go back to the method. Like technically this could be async. We could await on this and we could say router.push and go to the home page. Um, but ultimately, we need to say sign out and make sure we call that. And I think signing out will just um, actually, we can just give it a callback URL like this. We don't need to do router.push and technically setting this to be open false, like I don't think we even need to do. Um, we'll keep it in just in case. Actually, no, I don't think we need to do this. Let's just go ahead and do those two actions. And that should sign us out and redirect us. So I'm gonna go to like my rooms over here. And then I have two rooms attached to this user. So if I were to go and just delete my account, like yes, it signed me out. Go to Drizzle, refresh. I have no rooms anymore. It deleted my user. Um, this is my other account. So that worked perfectly fine. Awesome. I'm back in we can just remake that account as well now something a lot of applications have is like blank placeholder state so right now there are no rooms in my system and it might be nice to have like an image that says there's no rooms so i like using something called undraw um, undraw.co you go there and we can just find like a 
an icon, like not found or something. And let's just find an icon that seems like it might be a good approach to like no data. Here we go. This might be good. We're going to download this SVG and put it in our directory. Okay. And then let's go back to the page, uh, which was browse. So let's go to the browse page and we want to display if there's absolutely no rooms, then we should probably display that. Okay. So I'm going to go down here and say, if rooms that length is equal to zero, then we're going to display an image. I shall make it a div, make it a div inside the div. We'll say image source is equal to slash, um, no data SVG. The width is 200 height is 200 alt is no data image, something like that. And then underneath that, we could say, just put like an H2, no rooms yet. Great one. But you can create one. You can create one. How about that? You know, never mind. I'll just call it, I'll just say no rooms yet. Um, and then here we'll say class name is flex. I'll say justify center item center. And let's go back to our app. Let's make sure this shows up. Goals, no rooms credit yet. We definitely want to do a flex column on that. So we'll say flex call the gap of four. a while to reload the h2 itself we should probably say class name is text of 2xl say that and then we could just go ahead and like put some margin top 24 on that thing just to move it down and we'll do the same thing with your room so like we should probably copy and paste this we'll go to um where's your rooms we'll go to your rooms and then we're going to go over here, paste this in. Again, we'll auto import this. Maybe change the text to say you have no rooms. And then sometimes I like to add a button underneath this. So like it just lets the user quickly do the action they need to do when something's not there. So like they can just click create room and also create it up here if they want to go back to browse. There you have it. Might make sense to do the same thing with the other one. So like, uh, let's find that button, put it down there, just so that there's two different ways the user can get reminded to create the thing. So I think we have implemented quite a lot in this application. I do want to point out one more thing that stream does provide a chat SDK. So we could actually have some live chat functionality added in. If we wanted to bring that in, they have some good docs that kind of explain how you can do this. And of course they have integration with react. So you can kind of go through here, you are able to bring in a chat widget, which that might be the next steps. If I were to continue doing that is like add a chat widget here. So users can chat with each other, upload images, maybe upload code snippets, etc. For right now, I want to show you how you could potentially get this deployed to production. So, so I'm logged into railway, which again is a paid service. So there's various ways you can deploy a Next.js application. You can use Vercel, you can use SST. You can maybe just host it on Netlify, but you're going to need a database and you're going to need a host to basically host your Next.js application. I've been using Railway for my little side projects. I think it's pretty good. Um, this is not sponsored by Railway. I'm just saying that this is a service you could potentially use, um, but it will probably cost money, right? To set up an account, it costs like $5 and they give you $5 credit. So anyway, I'm going to click add a service and we're going to create a database. Now, locally we're using Postgres, so we probably want to use Postgres as well. And that'll spin up a PostgreSQL database for you. Second thing we're going to do is I'm going to add another service and I'm going to hook it up to our dev finder repo. So now we have a database that's spinning up and we have a host to run our service our Next.js service somewhere. Now, as Postgres is getting set up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some of these variables. So for example, there should be a Postgres URL. Let's try to find that. Here it is. You look at here, here's the URL. I'm going to copy this and we want to make sure that we run our initial migration to set up the tables. So remember the way we did it locally is we said DB push, but we can actually change that and connect it to a remote database if we want to. So instead of doing drizzle kit DB push and using this config file, we're going to change the database URL. So I'm going to say npm run DB push and inside of our .env, 
this is like a hacky way you could do it. Um, overall, like you'd probably want to have this set up in your CI CD pipeline. Let's grab that database URL variable again. Okay, I'm going to paste it in. And now this will basically overwrite our local one. So if I save this and I run db push, we should see it apply those changes. Um, if I scroll down down here, I say yes, execute all these commands. It's going to create all those tables, go back to railway, go to our data. Notice that we have the rooms, the accounts, the sessions, etc. So that's how you can do like a quick migration slash deployment from your local machine. Super easy to do. Now, secondly, we need to make sure that we set up our deploying dev finder service with some environment variables. So the thing I like about Railway is that it actually looked at our .env file slash our sample, and it knows that we need to add some stuff in already. So like, for example, I can just go ahead and put that database URL here. The Google client ID, we get to go ahead and grab that. The secret, let's grab that. Next off secret, I'm just gonna grab this one. Grab this API key. And then we're also gonna grab the secret stream key. Now, obviously some of this stuff, when you're going to production, you need to change, right? You should not be using this. You need to actually generate a real secure next auth secret. And for the Google client ID and the secret, you probably shouldn't be using the same IDs and secrets that you're using for your dev environment, for your production environment. So you wanna go in, you wanna create a completely different Google uh, app with different credentials and probably turn that on for production. So let's just go ahead and say add all. And there should be a way to basically redeploy this after adding um, your environment variables. So yeah, I'm going to click here, apply nine changes, I'll say deploy. And that should kick off basically all of the stuff that I've been running locally. It's going to run it on a remote server, and we should get a deployed app. So if I look at this, you can see it's going to start building, and then it's going to end up deploying, and it's going to ask us if we want to add in a custom domain. Now, while that's deploying, let's go to settings and I'm going to say generate a domain. You can also hook in a real custom domain, which I'm not going to do in this instance. But now we have a domain here, which we could potentially use. Now, we do want to go back to our dev finder OAuth client IDs, and we have to basically make sure we add in that new URL that Railway has given us, or else when you try to log in, it's just not going to work. So I'm going to say API auth callback Google. Go ahead and save both of those. And now when this fully gets deployed, we should be able to access it on a deployed URL. All right, so now it says that our app is active and we should be able to go to our app here. This will take a little bit of time to propagate, but then once it's ready, you will see our application hopefully deployed here. All right, and so it's loading up. Notice that this is the application that we were running locally, but now it's working on a deployed environment. So let's verify we can log in and do all the other stuff that we were doing before. Hopefully it works, I'll sign in. Sign in with Google. Um, there is a little thing that's messed up here. So when I click log in, notice that it took me to localhost 3000. That's not good. We actually need to make sure we set a next auth URL. And that's kind of outlined in the next auth documentation. So I think we can go back to railway. And we're going to go to the variables here and make sure we add in a new variable. And we're going to say add in the full URL for our app here. So let's just do... Um, Do this, add that in, go ahead and just redeploy that change. And just for the sake of it, we should probably have that local. So like, let's grab the next auth URL. We're going to say HTTP localhost 3000. And then in the sample, we should add it in here probably. All right, so that second deployment is done. Let's go here and just hard refresh just in case. Try signing in one more time. Okay, so now if I log in, it should kick us back to our production URL. And if I go browse rooms, there should no longer be any rooms here. So let's just go ahead and create another one. I'll say dev finder and working on a side project. I'll put the URL there and I'll say TypeScript, next.js, and submit. Let's make sure that this can create the room. Um, I don't know why I took it back to the home page. It's probably something we have to fix, but good enough. Let's just go ahead and look at the room here. And now we can join it. Let's say allow the microphone and allow the camera. And everything else should probably just work like it did uh, locally.
And then we can go back to your rooms and we should be able to edit this one like we did before. Go ahead and click edit, add an exclamation mark. That works fine. And then we should be able to delete the room. Awesome. And then also, Oh, I think we're missing some, like, I don't have the delete account button, so I need to delete the account. I need to um, do a push. We also don't have the placeholder stuff there. So I think I have a bunch of changes locally, which I probably need to make sure I get added in. I'm going to go ahead and say ability to delete account and then placeholder or empty state images. And, uh, and that should automatically kick off another railway deployment. And we should see that in about five minutes. I think that is going to wrap up everything I'm going to cover in this tutorial. Again, the code can be found at github.com slash webdevcody slash devfinder. It'll be in the description link below. And then, of course, I do want to give that final special thanks to our sponsor, Stream. Go check out getstream.io and play around with their libraries. If you ever need to get a really easy to implement video or audio or chat, share components in React, uh, as you saw in this video, it's very easy to get integrated. So I definitely recommend and like always, I have a Discord channel. You guys are welcome to join. If you have any questions about this tutorial or want to ask me anything, the link for the Discord will be below in the description. Other than that, have a good day and happy coding.